Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the City the Commission Conference Board. meeting this uh, January 10th, 2023. Settle down, everybody. Okay, let's get to that agenda. Okay, so um, thank you all for being here. This begins our conference meeting. We have a number of items to discuss as a commission here on the uh, on the um, uh, on the agenda that's been provided to us today. Uh, let us begin with the communications to the city commission. We have three communications. The first is from the Sustainability Advisory Board, uh, and their request is to um, encourage the City Commission to consider a 2030 net zero greenhouse gas, gas emission goal. Um, I had the conversation with the City Manager and with other members of his senior staff on this. Mr. City Manager, could you um, explain to the community uh, what, are, what has been the Commission's feelings regarding this and uh, what is uh, staff's recommendations in connection with this request? So yes, and for that, um, I'd like to ask Dr. Gassman to also come up and share some um, some thoughts as well. But um, it is something that we can look at uh, what other cities are doing and look at the ordinances that they're doing. There's also some um, uh, ambition to see if we can provide some um, some incentives uh, so that these electric vehicle stations. They, can they're be asking available. that we that we um, that we uh, provide. Uh, electric vehicle charging stations um, uh, and require them with each new development. Now, I don't know if we can require them. Requirements a bit uh, of a, it's tough. We certainly, so, we can certainly provide the incentives, right? Incentives would be something a little more um, feasible, but requirement is probably a limitation we can't require. Right. And Dr. Gassman, can you elaborate more? Uh, you push the button. Dr. Nancy, there we go. Yeah. Dr. Nancy Gassman, Assistant Public Works Director. So the item before you today is the Sustainability Advisory Board uh, asking the commission to consider ordinances that would uh, support policies to make our community electrical vehicle charging ready. Um, and those ordinances would be within the Land Development Code. There have been numerous other organizations, other municipalities within the South Florida area that have adopted these EV ready policies uh, in order to ensure that we are ready for the next phase of electric vehicles that are coming into the market. Um, Glenn Hadwin is here with me today. He's the sustainability manager for the city and he can give you a few quick sound bites on what we're expecting in terms of the changes in the EV vehicle market coming forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, Glenn Hadwin, Sustainability Manager. Um, one of the reasons a lot of cities are starting to adopt these type of ordinances is that um, all the forecasts say that EV sales, EV adoption will accelerate dramatically in the next um, decade or two. Um, there, we've seen project projections that EV sales will increase five-fold in the U.S., in the neck by 2030 to about 5 million a year. When you look at the, um, the states that purchase the most EVs, California is first, but Florida is second. Um, there's substantial increased costs from when you go to install e EV chargers after construction has been finished. It can be uh, over three and a half times as much, one study found. So, these ordinances establish the infrastructure. It may in include some stations and some just having the wiring in place. Um, and mo many auto manufacturers have incentives out there to, um, to increase their manufactured emails to uh, e e electric vehicles to 50 to 100% of their fleet over the next five to 15 years. And there's about five to over 10 Florida municipalities have existing requirements for EV charging. And one more point I would just like to remind you, the reference to the net zero goal is something the commission adopted in December 2021. This city commission established a net zero goal 
um, community-wide by 2050 and for government operations by 2040. Great, thank you so much. Dr. Grassman, do you have anything else to add? No, so the item before you is to, um, whether you want to direct staff to start to look into developing this type of ordinance or these types of policies moving forward. Um, what does the commission think? Uh, obviously, you know, the state statute does not permit municipalities like ours to increase the financial burden of uh, developments. Otherwise, that burden of the increased uh, cost of the developer uh, is um, ultimately shouldered by the municipality. But the incentive approach is what I think is probably the best path if this commission directs staff to, um, to consider what kinds of incentives we can suggest for new construction. So any comments from the commission? Do we want to give direction to the city staff to look into how we should could structure an incentive program for new developments in order to install at least the infrastructure for uh, charging stations, not, not so much necessarily this the charging station itself. Anyone have any thoughts or comments on that? I think it's a good idea, Mayor. Um, also, I'd like to see us do more than that. I, I believe we only have about 20 electric charging stations within our public facilities in the city. Um, I think that we should also look at ways to increase that number as well. Um, that's my opinion. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yes, I think it's um, really warranted in the direction that um, everything is going regarding to electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a good idea if we look into it and see how we could move forward if um, we agree on that together. All right, so what, if you don't, if you think you can uh, proceed with that to see if you can come back to the commission with some proposed um, changes to our ordinances so that we can find ways to incentivize new development to provide those charging stations. Great, all right, there you go. Thank you so much. And thank you members of the Sustainability Advisory Board for bringing uh, that uh, request to the commission. The next uh, communication is the um, uh, Education Advisory Board. And the Education Advisory Board um, talks about a lot of things. Um, in particular, they recommend that the, uh, that the commission continue to support efforts to collaborate with the Bezos Academy. Um, um, Zoe, do you want to talk to us about the, uh, I know that the commission previously uh, voted to approve collaboration. What's the status on those efforts? Correct. Uh, Zoe Saunders, Chief Education Officer. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. I'd uh, just like to briefly uh, describe the Bezos Academy. The Bezos Academy is a national network of tuition-free preschools. They offer full-day, year-round um, early childhood education to three-, four-, and five-year-olds living in underserved communities. Uh, they look for partners to help them identify where the needs are uh, to best serve the community. Uh, part of the partnership relationship is that the host would uh, provide rent-free space and the Bezos Academy would cover the capital expenses involved in retrofitting that space for the preschool and all operating expenses for 10 years. Um, previously, we, we actually started exploring this partnership in the summer of 2021. At that time, our focus was partnering with Broward County Public Schools and looking at the um, Bezos Academy being located in under-enrolled elementary schools. We did pursue that option and identified several uh, spaces that would be viable. However, when we presented that to the school board at a workshop, the direction was to halt planning at this time. We then redirected our efforts to look at hosting the Bezos Academy at city-owned properties, and we've been in, involved in that investigation now uh, for several months. Um, at this point, uh, we have looked at the site viability of the newly acquired property um, in the city of Fort Lauderdale on the 800 uh, Northwest 22nd, I think, Avenue, um, and that's something that we can continue to explore moving forward. Um, the conversation with the Education Advisory Board was just to continue that exploration uh, to expand early learning opportunities um, in the city of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, the Education Advisory Board does support that, 
Um, there was um, one member that did oppose that communication, and it was really related to concern over a new provider creating competition for existing providers. Uh, so I do want to assure you that um, the city has been working really closely with the Early Learning Coalition and early learning providers, including YMCA and Jack and Jill Children's Center, to really understand the early learning ecosystem and identify where the best fit would be uh, for this partnership. Uh, moving forward, we will be bringing a presentation to the commission on early learning, the state of early learning in our city, and that will include an overview of existing providers, uh, data around um, performance and enrollment, um, and also an overview of the Bezos Academy. So, Zoe, let me ask you a question. If um, the school board rejected our overtures to partner with us on this, um, and again, I, I'm still I'm still trying to deal with what what that was about. Um, and I believe it was Miss uh, Jamarillo, uh, Jaramillo, who opposed the motion. I looked at the minutes for the dialogue, and it didn't seem to be anything that was attributed to her in connection with her vote here. Um, so when, when, when you say that it brings up the, uh, uh, the, the situation of competition with existing providers, um, is there someone suggesting that we don't need this anymore? Like all the kids are already provided for and there's no more need out there that, that existing providers are feeling threatened that uh, there's still someone else, someone new on the block who's going to, who's going to um, uh, capture the, the, uh, the um, the overflow here. I mean, it seems to me that we can't have enough of this, and yet, mm -hmm. yet we're finding pushback because of of territory, you know, territory, and and you know, what, what explain a little bit to us what's going on here. And, um, in the city of Fort Lauderdale, there are many, um, as part of the elementary school data metrics, we look at kindergarten readiness. And unfortunately, many of the schools um, in the city of Fort Lauderdale have a high percentage of children entering kindergarten not ready for school. Um, so it's been a big focus of the Education Advisory Board to look at opportunities to expand early learning education. Um, in terms of working within the space, we've been really intentional about trying to coordinate with those partners. Um, so we've worked with Head Start and we're seeing that their enrollment is increasing. Um, since COVID. Also, the Early Learning Coalition has indicated that they receive about 150 applications for school readiness per week, um, and the majority of those applications are coming from the 33311 zip code. So that's just a couple of indicators as we look at the need for early learning, and we're compiling additional data that we'd like to bring forward to you as we explore where the best fit could be for this partnership. So it's really concerning to me that this is taking so long to happen. Um, the need is definitely out there. And has there been any space made available to us at the YMCA or in any of the CRA buildings, um, any in the 33311 area that we can immediately you know, utilize and retrofit with the funds of, of the academy to get this program up and going? Because mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is getting ridiculous. The, the YMC has a partner with the Del Mar Arts Academy. When we first started exploring this potential partnership with the Bezos Academy, they'd already secured that partnership. Okay. Um, so that, that wasn't an opportunity at the time. Um, and we have looked at several city properties to see what could be a good fit. Um, there is the potential for the newly acquired parcel where we could explore um, as well. Maybe you could work Mayor? with the commissioner. Yeah, yeah if say, I could, could. Um, chime in on this, please. Um, as far as territory or competition, what I'm hearing back from the constituents, we have several um, child care centers in the community that are legacies. They have been there for decades. Right. And this, um, the opportunity for Bezo to come in, it appears to be a direct competition for them. Um, when it comes to partnership, you know, being new, I don't know what the offer is. Is there an opportunity that we could speak with those legacy child care centers to see how maybe we could be a partnership with them as well. But with what's being proposed, like especially at the site of um, 8th and 22nd Road, you have two child care centers that have been there for, I would say, at least four decades, if I'm not short changing the years. And that will be a direct in, um, uh, impact on what they're doing as well. So that's where um, the conversation is coming in as regard to uh, why it's not being solely embraced. Yeah. 
and I think something we can consider is how as a city we can help to um, promote education on the importance of early childhood education and also share the offerings that are available. Um, we do have a number of child care centers that are underutilized. Some of that is a factor of staffing, not being able to, to have the staff there to grow. Um, in other instances, it may be that families aren't aware of the scholarship opportunities to at attend um, a daycare center. So I think we could look at a multi-prong approach mm -hmm. where we could explore this partnership, but additionally look at a wider scale communication strategy to educate our community on the benefits and the opportunities available. All right, but can you bring this back to the commission in a couple of months and let us know what's going on? Because, um, you know, I realize that there are people who are already in the business of doing this, and maybe we can, maybe the Bezos folks can uh, perhaps improve the existing conditions that that the legacy providers have been uh, offering over the years. It doesn't, it wouldn't hurt, and because um, ultimately what's happening here is we have to provide what we can to the to kids, especially kids that are that are uh, uh, underserved in our community, and uh, if someone is holding out their hand to help us. You know, we should grab that and and take advantage of it as much as we can. So, um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of slack to pick up here, uh, and I think that, you know, the city of Fort Lauderdale should be, you know, at the front of the line here and trying to make sure that we can benefit from this uh, program that's been offered to us. So, if you can continue to work with uh, the commissioner, that would be great. I'd be happy to. All right. I was just going to also suggest that we do um, have a dialogue with those legacy. Um, child care centers and see how we could come to some type of understanding oh, and then that. we can see how we could move forward on this opportunity. I think that'd be very productive. Thank you. For Thank that. you, Joe. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Zoe. Um, uh, communication number three, this is also from the Education Advisory Board. Um, they're asking that the City Commission uh, engage in some kind of new program to encourage employees and members of the commission to volunteer their time to work in the uh, local schools um, and to uh, to help implement programs to uh, establish volunteer opportunities at these schools um, not sure exactly how that how we go about doing that I don't know who's qualified uh, but um, how do we go about doing that sounds good but is it is it you know possible is it feasible so the education advisory board reflected on uh, the volunteerism that already exists. Um, so we had discussed that many employees volunteer through Kapow and other programs, um, and that prompted a conversation to broaden that and expand that effort. Um, this would require some further exploration uh, with our human resources team, um, and that's something that we can explore and they can help us identify what considerations uh, we'll need to look at as we contemplate um, an expanded program model. Okay. All right. Thank you. I know Commissioner Glassman is looking for something to do when he retires from the commission, so <laughs> to resume his teaching talents. Thank you, Mayor. Oh, that's yeah, that I, including. It's, I always I appreciate you looking out for now. me. Yeah, you can do that now. Actually, many of us do go into the schools, mm -hmm. and we do this. Yes. We, you know, we the, the FOP has a wonderful reading program that I've participated in. I think most of us do find opportunities and. Uh, try and uh, you know participate in our local schools and um, this though looks a little bit further this recommendation they looking for I guess a model for employees to actually yeah, it's have for employees some throughout the system time. so I don't know how that all works but I'm right. sure Zoe will figure it all out okay. but again thank you mayor for always all thinking right. of me thank you <laughs> um, moving on to uh, CF1 discussion of the 2023 state legislative program um, Daphne, are you going to be presenting? So what's going on up and out in Tallahassee? Nothing much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Um, Daphne Sainville, Government Affairs and Economic Development Manager. I will be presenting very hopefully quickly and briefly the 2023 proposed state legislative program and also get um, your priorities that you would like to see added um, or uh, statements in here that need to be strengthened, kind of wordsmithed, and then bring it back for your approval at the next uh, commission meeting. 
So I will begin briefly by saying it is week four um, for interim committee weeks in Tallahassee next week. I'll be up there to meet and greet with our new delegates. Um, with redistricting, we have some new uh, representatives on the House and the, the Senate. I'm going to skip and start with page four of nine with the fundamental principles. Yesterday, Commissioner Glassman, you had mentioned that you would like to see a statement added to talk about basic human and civil rights. Um, I added in a new statement that the city opposes legislation that infringes on the basic human and civil rights of Floridians. And I also added in a phrase to discuss our resolution process. So during legislative session, if there are any resolutions in regards to legislation that is proposed, we would be able to modify and be flexible throughout the 60 days. If you're okay with that wording, or if you'd like me to wordsmith it a bit more, I would be more than happy to do that. I'm sorry, do we have that language oh. anywhere added to us? Or? So the new edits were sent to the clerk, and I believe I can have IT put it up on the screen. I, don't think I, I believe the it? exhibit that you have is the exhibit from the original. The original, right. so Because yes. I haven't seen those words, but I mean, what you're saying sounds fine to me, but thank you. Okay. Apologies for that. No problem. You want, you want to reread that goal again? So in the fundamental principles at the very top, it's page four. No, that is not Just page right. four of exhibit one. I don't think that's page four. No, that's the wrong... Uh, I think page, page it three. Would be your Try page, page three. It would be your page three. But that's okay. We can we can keep moving, and I will send you the the new okay. Thank um, you. Exhibit. Well, I want to I want to know what the language is. Yeah, I'm going to I'm about to repeat it. So the language says the city opposes legislation that infringes on the basic human and civil rights of Floridians. Um, next sentence is an integral portion of the advocacy effort by the commission focuses on the resolution process. Resolutions provide staff, advocacy teams, and the state executive and legislative branches with the city's position regarding proposed legislation during legislative session. All right, sounds good. We then go into the next fundamental principle, which it, um, relates to homelessness and housing opportunities where we address homelessness and the creation of housing opportunities, including evaluation of activities and initiatives that can address the root cause of homelessness while identifying ways to create additional housing opportunities in the city. So we also support the full funding of the Sadowski Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, as you know, last year, the state did pass legislation that would cease the withdrawal of those housing dollars to balance the statewide budget. We also support the Florida League of Cities legislative priorities and policy statements. I sit on the Transportation and Intergovernmental Relations Committee where we talked about the dollars to balance the statewide budget. Oh, nice, I echo. We also support the Florida League of Cities legislative priorities oh. and policy statements. Who's talking? I sit That's on right. the Transportation yeah. and Intergovernmental Relations Committee where we talk about I have a twin. to balance. <laughs> well, whatever you said, I guess, was worth repeating. There you go. <laughs> That's always good. Um, we support the general overall legislative priorities of the Florida League of Cities. Um, so long as they do not conflict with what is in this legislative program or what the city commission passes in the resolution process. Uh, sovereign immunity is an ongoing issue that occurs each year. So we oppose those legislative efforts to increase or eliminate the monetary limits. Last year, there was a lot of back and forth. It was really exciting to see how the limits were increased then decreased. And then we thought the bill was dead and it came back with a solid increase of 1 million per incident or 3 million for group incidents, and that bill ended up dying. But we do expect to see that legislation come back in full force, and we will do what we can to defeat that. Um, taxes and fees, we oppose that legislation. Um, unfunded mandates, while some policy bills are great, um, that often leads to unfunded mandates on local governments, so we oppose that type of legislation. Um, and we support funding for early learning, education, and full funding for workforce readiness programs. Yeah. 
Um, in the next page, we go through intergovernmental collaborations. So we talk about short-term rentals, vacation rentals. There has been a bill filed this year related to vacation rentals. However, we know that the Senate president, um, or incoming Senate president, Kathleen Pasadomo, uh, is has told us that she will not take up a bill in the Senate re regarding vacational vacation rentals, so we might seek some reprieve. However, we won't know until they actually end legislative session and see what happens in the negotiations process during um, budget negotiations. Uh, we would uh, support legislation to change the date for non-ad uh, valorem assessments, uh, and then to amend a uh, Florida statute that allows closed door meetings on pre-suit liability claims. Currently, we can't shade uh, pre-suit liability claims, so we're looking to see if there's any legislation that's been filed that we can piggyback right on, or we can ask uh, one of our representatives to file a standalone bill. Um, and in that, we'll consult with our lobbying teams to see what strategy fits us best. Uh, fire Arms regulation is a blanket statement that we oppose their attempt to prohibit local governments um, from implementing firearms regulations. We do know that this is gonna be a hot topic, especially with the governor wanting this to be an um, open carry state uh, without the licensing. So we'll see where that goes. Um, infrastructure. Mayor, can I interrupt for one second? So I just wanna understand procedurally, Mayor. So we have a, a list of priorities that are established here. Are we expected to be commenting favorably or opposed on these individual items? Um, what, what, is, what is the expectation here? So every year, you know, the commission is being told um, uh, what the legislative priorities are, are for representing the city. Um, they are a culmination of summaries that staff have um, um, gleaned from conversations and, and meetings that the commission has had. This is an opportunity for any one of us to comment on this, but I, was, I thought we'd wait till the end and then we can go back and you can come on, comment on any one of these items and see which side you think the city should support or not support. Okay. All right. It's not, a, it's not just a, a given that these are the priorities. You can add to them, you, we can modify them, we can address, address each and every one of them. But, well, and that was kind of my question, is I wanted to know where this list of priorities came from because these are not my priorities. And I haven't had any conversations with staff or our lobbyists as to what is on this list. So, Well, you're talking in particular about firearm regulation? At, at the very least, yes. Okay, so the firearm reg regulations um, comment stems from uh, the, the previous decision of this commission to participate in the lawsuit, which uh, would hopefully, which was intended to loosen up the uh, ability for local municipalities to to regulate uh, firearm use, and uh, and I believe that we lost, uh, Mr. Spence, I believe we lo we lost in court on that. Do you remember? I don't think you were involved with that case, but I haven't. I was. You know, the city was involved with the case. We signed on as plaintiffs, Correct. and I know we participated, and I know that there was. But it was based on an expression by the commission at that time to not allow for unregulated use of firearms in our city was one thing, and uh, um, and I believe there were a couple of other. But anyway, we participated in that lawsuit, and I think that's what this this comes. But, but I from. guess my question, Mayor, is that this is a carry forward of previously articulated direction to our lobbyists and to staff from the prior commission. So is this? So, and again, procedurally, I want to know: is am I expected to be offering up my uh, yeah, suggestions absolutely. as right. we go through these? Because I would prefer to have had a conversation with staff and the lobbyists prior to this presentation. I'd like to go through these one by one, and I don't think this is the appropriate format for that. Well, I, what I was going to do is allow uh, Daphne to complete her report, and then if there are any recommendations or suggestions as to any one of these items, then then I would invite any member of this commission to to express their opinion, and then the commission can discuss it. I mean, uh, okay. but, but because I think the legislature starts next week, right? Isn't that what you just said? So uh, interim committee weeks have begun. Uh, next week is interim committee week four. There are generally seven uh, before the 60-day legislative session actually begins on March, I believe, 7th. March, the session begins? Session begins. However, we need to get... Um, the most important is our appropriation requests that come from the departments. 
uh, in June, July, and August, I send out tentative or templates to department heads and division managers to see what um, gap funding is needed from the state uh, in order to be included in the state budget and hopefully not vetoed by the governor. And I'm more than happy to sit down with you to have further discussion um, about this, this program. It was developed rather quickly with an election year. Everything kind of shortens with the timeline and how much time I have to meet one-on-one -on -one with um, each commissioner, so I do apologize for that. Um, I, I am more than happy to sit down so we can discuss this. I just want to get through everything, at least get the appropriations um, discussed, and then sit down one-on-one -on -one with each of you to see what we can keep or what needs to be added. Um, and then go in depth with the process and, and how I'm formulating it moving forward. So, so then if I hear you, there'll be a second opportunity for us then to come back and, and ratify, if you will, this list. Because Correct. like I said, there are things on this list that I don't support. Correct. This is just the introduction, the workshop. And then okay. once I get through with all your um, commission priorities, so your individual district priorities that you want to see, and then a unified um, city commission priority on the dais, I will add in, make the tweaks, and then come back for full ratification and approval. Thank you. Please proceed. OK. Ooh, that was close. Um, so going into infrastructure resilience and transportation, there is the general statement um, that we examine and address infrastructure needs related to water, wastewater, and stormwater. Um, and integrate resilience in all the decisions relating to um, current and future city operations. I would go and read line by line, but I, I don't want to um, do a you know line by line type presentation, so I'll just briefly summarize each one, if that's okay. All right, so the commission supports legislation and funding for transportation enhancements focused on greenways, complete street initiatives. Um, we... Uh, also support legislation that requires flood, flood disclosures, promotes energy conservation and the inclusion of municipalities um, in the state environmental permitting process. We support the repeal of state regulations prohibiting local governments from banning the use of um, plastic bag styrofoam products. Last year's um, priority list included the ban of smoking on beaches, which was successful with a couple of modifications, so that was taken out since it was successful. Um, this one did not pass, so it's rolled into the new year. Uh, public safety, we support any type of initiative that focuses on fair and equitable um, justice system. And a new uh, initiative that was brought to me from Fire Rescue was the Blue Light Initiative. Currently, Fire Rescue and EMS uh, personnel cannot use blue emergency lights. If they're in cases of emergency, they have to use another vehicle to block in order to protect um, their personnel. So it would just require an amendment to uh, the Florida state statute to include fire rescue and EMS. Right now, only police um, can use that. So going into the appropriations requests that were received from the various departments and divisions, we look to arts and culture. There was a small modification in the second sentence that as a city known for its arts and culture, rather than saying the city commission, I put Fort Lauderdale, so it's grammatically correct. Thank you, Commissioner Glassman. Thank you. <laughs> um, that we support increased funding for historic preservation and the restore, restoration of full funding for the cultural arts. We also support funding for um, our FXC capital projects, um, marine and aviation industries. So relating to economic development, we support Visit Florida. Um, and we also support the reauthorization of the statewide qualified targeted uh, industry tax, which is the QTI tax. It was not reauthorized in 2020, but it did play a huge role in getting large corporations like Amazon, um, Hotwire, uh, and West Marine here uh, Citrix and uh, Sixth and other companies um, to move and relocate their headquarters and or staff here. Uh, we do support, um, another one is education, where we have our education enrichment program. We are asking for $705,000. We, are, we may be modifying that amount. There's some additional information that we were looking for because we believe the total operational cost is 1.5. The state cannot fund a full 
1.5 ask, so we are only asking for a portion, and then we have match dollars. So once that edit is made, and after having discussion with Miss um, Zoe Saunders um, and each one of you, we would see if that amount sticks and uh, what language needs to be adjusted. So this program basically is the city taking in that role, working with the school um, district and, and bridging the gap, the educational gap, especially with COVID in our, in our youth. The next one is housing and community development where we have the community court program. This is a recurring program where we ask for $100,000. So it's to reduce the daily uh, jail population by addressing the needs of homeless, um, petty crime and municipal ordinance offenders. Uh, we have community courts each Wednesday here. It's been a successful program thus far. Um, we basically provide participants with access services that they need to keep them off the streets, keep them clean. We did have uh, rapid rehousing in the exhibit that you have before us, but because we have more money than housing availability, we've decided to remove rapid rehousing from the mix um, simply because we want to remain in the state's good graces. Um, and we want to make sure that we're able to spend the money that we have and meet the needs that um, are needed for the community. In parks and recreation, we have two um, projects, Carter Park Improvements for 272500 um, It would be to resurface the Orange Bowl football field. Um, it would result in an increase of, uh, in usage by residents and visitors, and it would provide continued outdoor fitness opportunities, which supports the city's initiative to encourage its residents to live a healthy lifestyle. Hardy Park Improvements would... Um, we are asking for $555,000, which would install a new multi-purpose field. And with water conservation being critical, it would promote the city's sustainability initiatives. In resilience and infrastructure, we support the full funding for our projects to fight sea level rise and existing infrastructure projects. Um, current funding, we do have two projects there I did remove the sidewalk repairs project because it wasn't fully cooked um, and fully cooked projects, I would always highly recommend that we don't bring forward because we get more questions than answers and most likely we won't get funding. But we are asking for 700,000 for two stormwater pump station generators right here on New River. And it would, um, because during storms and power outages, the pump station, if the power goes out, it no longer operates, which causes massive flooding um, on downtown roads and on properties. We are asking for 1.5 million for the sanitary sewer system rehab of Basin B14. So this would um, rehab and replace uh, the sanitary sewer collection mains, manholes, and laterals to reduce water inflow and inf infiltration. Um, for transportation, we know this is critical. We know transportation dollars are huge on the federal level. There's a lot of trickle down money. Um, going to the state. So we have two projects. We have the Riverland Road Traffic Calming Project for 1 million, which we have identified the need to install traffic calming devices on Riverland Road to mitigate cut through traffic and incre increase pedestrian and bicycle um, safety. Uh, one project that is not there is the Lauder Trail Project uh, for 900,000. It's a new addition. Uh, received additional information that the city has an existing greenway on Flagler, and this segment of Lauder Trail will extend it to connect to Holiday Park. And that is it. Okay, so thank you. Show. I appreciate that. Uh, I think at this point, between now and the next time uh, you come back, uh, let each member of the commission have the opportunity to meet with you and to go over there. Um, their priorities and their concerns and perhaps modifications of any recommendations they may have on these priorities that are put together by staff. Does that, does that sound okay with everybody? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Okay, uh, business one, <clears throat> update on subsurface tunnel system uh, for downtown Fort Lauderdale to Fort Lauderdale Beach. Before we begin, there's one person who signed up to speak on that. Um, I just want to give uh, the commission uh, a little background on where we got to, why, why we're even discussing this today. So, you know, when I first became a commissioner back in 2003, almost 20 years ago, 
um, this community has continued to try to grapple with the issue of traffic. Um, in particular, traffic on the beach, traffic going to and from the beach, and, um, and I have to say that over the years, um, many people, many community leaders, uh, homeowners, visitors, people who have participated in these, uh, in these efforts, focus groups, the business people that uh, operate their businesses along the Las Olas Corridor, all of them have participated in efforts year after year to try to come up with solutions in order to find ways to alleviate the um, annual and daily traffic problems that we have on that particular corridor. Um, I know that after I left the District 2 Commission seat, uh, Commissioner Glassman uh, uh, carried the, the baton and continued in that dialogue. Uh, he, along with uh, previous Commissioner Ben Sorensen, uh, held neighborhood meetings. They had, uh, con we hired multiple consultants, very expensive consultants, to try to come up with solutions in order to see what we can do to uh, reshape that corridor and to try to make it better for not just the visitors, but also for the people that live and work in and around that area. Um, that was a two-year effort. What happened as a result was um, multiple suggestions, often conflicting, but um, in the end, I'm not quite sure we came up with any solution to alleviate traffic and congestion that we experienced on the Los, Los Olas Corridor. Having said that, um, all this time, uh, an opportunity came to our attention that there was a company out there that was um, engaged in a more cost-effective manner in which to create alternative travel pathways, in this case, underground pathways, in order to try to help communities deal with their traffic problem. So um, we started engaging in conversations with a company called The Boring Company, which is uh, basically owned by Elon Musk. And it intrigued us to at least see what they had to offer. What was it that they were saying? So a number of the members of the commission, I think almost all the members of the commission, went out and visited their, their test site in Los Angeles and the operational tunnel that they have in Las Vegas. And uh, we've had multiple discussions with the folks in the, with the Boring Company. They've come out here. We've been out there. And it was an opportunity for us to engage one another and to educate us to see exactly what their goals were and how they could accomplish them. In the meantime, uh, the, city, the city commission um, partnered with the Boring Company on an initiative to at least investigate the feasibility of tunneling between the downtown and the beach. Why would that be a goal of the city? To do so would help remove a number of vehicles from the travel lane, take them off of Las Olas Boulevard, take them off of Broward Boulevard, take them off of Northeast 15th Avenue. These are choke points in our city, and it was an attempt to try to come up with a way. I mean, we can't expand the roads, and, and doing nothing is no option. So our previous uh, transportation director, working with our commission and our community, came up with some nuances of trying to figure out ways to uh, deal with traffic. There were some um, lane widenings, there were some uh, changes in intersections, but in the end it really didn't cut down on the amount of traffic that we have in, the, in this area, and it did not really uh, increase the amount of traffic flow that we currently experience. Now as many of you know, the city of Fort Lauderdale has become a very popular destination not just for tourists, for, but for people who have chosen to move to Fort Lauderdale and to begin new careers and families. And it's become uh, a destination so much so that you see a significant amount of new development taking place, all of which adds to our, our traffic issues. So when we had an opportunity to talk with these folks, um, they said, we're going to look at Fort Lauderdale, and I believe Fort Lauderdale will be a, um, an example of how we want to present to other 
cities around the country because Fort Lauderdale seems like the perfect opportunity to show how an, in an initiative such as this could work. <laughs> so the commission um, voted to uh, work with the Boring Company and they are currently in the process of doing their feasibility study. And we now have three members, three new members to this commission who have not had that opportunity, really, to go visit the, 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 uh, the initial tunnel that was built in Los Angeles, as well as the operational tunnel system that's now being built in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, they plan to build, I believe it's a 29 mile underground system and they already have uh, uh, part of it in, in place and operational between their airport and I believe their convention center. And what's great about this is that we got to experience firsthand how it works, how feasible it is, and how desirable it can be to a community such as ours in trying to finally come up with solutions to eliminate or minimize the traffic concerns that we have in our city. It's no panacea but it's, it's one way of trying to deal with traffic that we have for so many decades, again, since I was first a commissioner in 2003, and before me, the issue of traffic along these corridors has long been a problem in our city, but an opportunity that will provide us with solutions that I think that are very, very uh, important to our community. So last December, the commission, um, decided to put a hold on further investigating the feasibility and we put a kind of put a stop on things because I think it's important for this commission to um, participate and to re revitalize the discussion uh, as to as to this tunnel system. We have since learned a number of things. Um, uh, we have since learned that the boring company is now uh, finding that this project is so important to them that they may fund the entire pro uh, proposition. So it would not cost the city any money to build this tunnel system. Um, to me, this is not only a game changer, but a great opportunity for us to think about how we are going to be able to transform the city of Fort Lauderdale into a 21st century city and beyond. And I think that it, it beckons us to each think about you know, each member of the commission and members of the community to think about how we are going to transition from who we have been all these years to what we can become in the future. So um, it was decided to bring this item uh, before the commission to decide whether or not this commission wants to continue forward with this opportunity or whether they do not. Um, and honestly, um, I really think that before this commission should make any decisions, that they should each go out to Las Vegas and see what it's all about. See what the opportunity is. Don't just, you know, think of it in the abstract and, and, and just, you know, feel that something can't work because it hasn't been done before. I think we have opportunities here that are, are being presented to us. And now that I know that it may be at no cost to the city, I mean, it seems to me like something that uh, we should take seriously. But again, it's up to the commission. Um, uh, you have not had the benefit that the other commissioners up to now have had that benefit, and so that's why um, I believe that this new commission or the new members of the commission should really uh, be able to take advantage of those opportunities, see for eyewitness it uh, themselves, and to be able to make an educated and informed decision uh, if we should decide to go forward or not to go forward. So. This is on the uh, the table today, and I, I'll start with uh, Commissioner Herbs. We'll start with District 1. Do you have any thoughts about the subject? Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I have had the opportunity to speak with representatives from the Boring Company, and I shared some of my thoughts with them, and I'll share that with you and uh, the audience as well. So when we typically look at a P3 project, it is usually intended to solve a problem, and I don't quite share the perspective that the traffic problem that we experience on Las Olas is one of folks going out to the beach. So having lived here for a while, when I want to go to the beach, I don't go down Las Olas. When I go to Las Olas, I go there to visit the shops, I go there to visit the restaurants. Um, I'm not using it to get to the beach. If I want to get to the beach, I go down Broward Boulevard, cut down 15th Avenue, and go out to the beach. Or I'll take Sunrise, or I'll take 17th Street Causeway, or some other road. I think the folks that are going down Las Olas are there because they want to be on Las Olas and they don't mind that it's a little slower. They're not looking to speed and get there rapidly. That's not the point. 
As I shared with the Boring Company, if they want to solve a traffic problem, the traffic problem is from the airport to the port. It's from the airport to downtown. Those are routes that I think would add value to the city in terms of reducing traffic issues and assist those people that are flying in to go out on one of our cruise ships. So I, I don't think this is solving a problem. And as I, as I shared with them, you know, if you're coming in from one of our western suburbs, you're not going to pack your kids and your uh, cart and your cooler and your umbrella and your towels into the car, drive all the way here, park at a parking lot, unload all of that stuff, go down into uh, the Tesla tunnel, go out to the beach, get out all of that, and carry it out to the beach, when you can drive another two miles and park at our parking garage at the beach. So not solving a problem. Folks coming down on Brightline was one of the other offered um, you know, alternatives or, or solutions. And, and as I shared with them, again, I don't see somebody getting on Brightline up in West Palm, coming to Fort Lauderdale to go to our beach when they have a perfectly good beach up in Palm Beach. Same thing for Miami. Nobody's going to get on the train to Miami, come up here to go out to Fort Lauderdale Beach. Again, not solving a problem. So I, I don't see where this is something that we would have undertaken on our own, which is generally the whole point of a public-private partnership, is we have something that we want to do, and we encourage people to come and provide us with that resource. Um, and, and then, as you know, when we do that, they typically pay us to do the analysis. I, I don't know of anyone where we're paying them to do an analysis. And in fact, I asked them, I said, where's your business plan? Because I don't remember ever seeing one when I was the auditor. It didn't come across my desk. There should have been something that demonstrated the, the fiscal feasibility of this project before we move forward on it. And they said, well, that's what this study is going to hopefully demonstrate is that it makes sense. And I have never seen a project in all my years of, of being in the financial realm, I've done this for 40 years, where somebody presents a project and hasn't done the analysis to make sure it's financially feasible before they even promote it. When I was in the investment banking world, this would not have seen the light of day until they were able to demonstrate that you know, what their path to profitability was. There's no business plan that says, here's our market, you know, here's our pricing model, here's where we expect to draw from. These are all the things that anybody that's looking to finance a project would expect. These are threshold items that you don't even have a conversation beyond that point until you've seen that and validated it. And we haven't done that, and I don't understand why. So in terms of the project itself, as, as I shared with the Boring Company, if they want to do this, if it's on their dime, if they're not asking us to fund any portion of it, I'm happy to give them the opportunity to go ahead and, and build a tunnel. I frankly think it's more of a theme park ride than I think it's a traffic solution. But you know, that's, that's my perspective on it. But I am not in favor of the city contributing a dime to the feasibility study or to any potential construction. Again, as I told the Boring Company, I'm happy to support your efforts to get funding from the federal government to go ahead and do this. You know, I'll, you know, one of the few times I'll actually, uh, you know, uh, endorse a resolution to go do something like that. Um, but, but I can't see again that this is solving a problem that Fort Lauderdale has in a meaningful way, and I don't think we should be contributing any staff time to it, or participating in it financially in any way, shape, or form. Again, as I said, when we did the water plant analysis, you'll remember each one of those proposers gave us $100,000 to do the analysis. We didn't give them $100,000. So I think we've got this completely turned around, and I don't think this is the right approach for the city, and it's certainly not fiscally responsible for us. Thank you. Uh, if I can respond to that, uh, I agree with you 100% that one of our biggest traffic problems is between the airport and the seaport. Um, unfortunately, we don't own the airport or the seaport or the pathway in between. Um, I have uh, had multiple discussions, just full disclosure, I've had multiple discussions with members of the county to try to encourage them to consider this as an option other than the option they are now considering, which is an overhead uh, um, I, is it a monorail system, I believe, they're looking to do, which is going to cost well over a billion dollars. Um, but everyone has their own approach to things. Um, you know, so uh, this was an opportunity for the city. Your, your comments regarding where you think the source of the traffic is coming from, I'm, I'm not sure I can agree with that, but 
you know, I understand your point of view, and uh, so we'll now hear from Commissioner Beasley Pittman. Hey, thank you, Mayor. Um, remembering how we decided to bring this back to the table to talk about it a little bit more, there was news stories um, carrying in all the networks about <laughs> Um, how this was not being followed through through the borrowing company in other cities and other conversations. So that was a red flag, I believe, for the commission initially to bring this back to the table. So um, You're talking about the Wall Street Journal article. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Right. For the Wall Street Journal's article. Um, but what what I need, what I have not seen, is, as John has said, I haven't seen a business plan. Haven't seen anything far as um, even a Las Solas corridor report, and I want to know how we're going to run a tunnel through salt water and, and how that's going to affect the, the possibility of that. And then also we're comparing it to salt water in the desert when we're saying Las Vegas. So those type of things are top on the top of my list why I don't understand and I'm not supporting it at this time. I don't have enough evidence, for one thing, anything to go on other than the other commission. The previous commission went out, um, all went out, and I believe it was only, it was not all of you, I think one commissioner did not attend. Commissioner McKenzie did not. Okay, and then at the vote it wasn't unanimous also, that was four to one, if I'm not incorrect. Commissioner McKenzie did not for support. Okay, right. so where I'm going with this, um, we need more information. I agree. Okay, I have nothing as a new commissioner. I have well, no my information. concern is what you read in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> um, despite all the presentations that we made, were made, um, you know that was a big uh, that was a that was a big surprise to all of us. I think we can all agree on that. Um, yes, but you also realize that not everything you read in the press is a hundred percent accurate. Well, so so it's, I, sometimes it's important to try to flesh out. All of the details, and 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 that is correct. But I think um, so. We're saying that the, the article, article may, may the have article been may have may not be entirely accurate representation of what was going on in those other communities. So, but but I think to your point, though, every member of this commission should have the opportunity to be made more aware of the the. Um, the feasibility of this, and I think that was the whole point in engaging them to do the feasibility report, was to determine the logistical um, suitability of this uh, tunnel going through our city, and to and then to come up with a cost-benefit analysis. Unless we know what those numbers are, they can't they can't possibly make a business plan until they know what all the numbers are. But again, in all fairness to any member of this commission, new or new or existing. Um, you know, the more information we get, the better, because this is a this is going to be a significant uh, opportunity that is going to um, that's going to be offered to us. And before we can accept it, we should really know as much as we can about it. So I agree with you 100 percent, Commissioner. And and one other thing, you mentioned that the the county had no um, interest in taking part when John mentioned the airport and the seaport and the county itself has rejected the plan. Well, they already have, they have a plan in place already. That's their thing. They already, this idea of their monorail system, mm -hmm. it's already been planned. They already have, they, they, they've, they're already on a track to do it. So they, they really didn't want to change it. Mike Udine, who was the mayor at the time, I believe he was the mayor at the time, he traveled to Las Vegas and he was very supportive of the tunnel idea. He loved the idea of bringing that tunnel system to, this, to, the, to the county and to the city, but he knew that the headwinds at the county would not permit it because they were already moving forward with their monorail system, and so he, he, he said it would never have any success. It wasn't because of any lack of, 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 of validity of the plan. It was just the, the, the way things were already happening at the county level. <clears throat> Commissioner Glassman. Yes, thank you, Mayor. So I did travel to Vegas, as you had mentioned. Um, I think four of us, or maybe all five of us did at the time. Um, I have been a supporter um, throughout each of the votes that we've had, but not a cheerleader, because I've always had some questions, and I've always had more questions as we've gone further and further. Um, so that being said, um, I 
I came to a conclusion after reading the Wall Street Journal um, that I even had more questions than I had before. So I did reach out to the folks uh, at Boring. Um, I wanted to get answers. I wanted to find out about each of those cities, each of those issues. Um, and, I, and I received answers that I, I found satisfactory. Um, you want to share those with us? OK, I'll be happy to, actually. Um, hold on, I have them written here somewhere. Um, so the first, the first issue that was brought up by the Wall Street Journal was about um, Ontario and the airport. Um, the cost rose to the $500 million because the municipality kept changing the locations and added a second tunnel. Um, and that uh, Boring said that they could not do it for the cost that was originally said because the scope uh, just kept changing uh, significantly. It wasn't that they didn't want to respond, but um, they just were not going to proceed under those original conditions. Um, it was mentioned about a third party environmental review, that there was a halt to that. Um, events happened in parallel that were not casually linked to the halt. Um, Boring did not back out because an environmental report was needed. Um, they just knew that several events took place that made Boring and Ontario move in opposite directions, uh, and it just was no longer uh, an appropriate fit. With regards to Maryland, Chicago, um, and Louisiana, Maryland, uh, the deal was not dead due to anything other than the fact that it was just not a right fit for either party at that time. Um, but they are hoping to go back and uh, resubmit another bid. Um, the plan was for a tunnel from D.C. to Baltimore, and because there are many jurisdictions between those two areas, uh, the transportation processes and politics uh, basically shut down that venture. Um, no one's fault, really. Uh, Chicago was a big, big um, advocate for doing the tunnel work, but that was under uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel at that time. Uh, he was a very big supporter of that project. When he decided not to run again, um, the new mayor, uh, Mayor Lightfoot, um, this was just not a priority for her. Um, and the, the agency that they created for that project just uh, went away because the new mayor just had no, no um, appetite for the project. Um, so also brought up in the article was the boring machines and building. Um, they do not have a domestic factory. It's proprietary. Um, we do know, by the way, and I will say um, that um, they, I think they, they was also been mentioned in other articles about uh, Fort Lauderdale maybe being a guinea pig for the process. Um, but I, I will tell you that in my research, um, since the time we went to Las Vegas in May, was it May of 21, I think it was? Um, by the way, I also have a very strong support letter here from former commissioner from District 1, um, Commissioner Maritis. She wrote on May 25th, 2021 to Governor DeSantis, basically looking for funding and, and letting the governor know um, how very much she was hoping to bring this project um, to Fort Lauderdale. And she wrote that while she was the uh, vice mayor, actually. Um, but when we were there in Vegas, it was such a small system. And I will tell you now that the city of Las Vegas and the county um, there have now expanded from five stations to 55 stations. Um, and over 35 miles, they're approaching 1 million um, passengers right now, ever since the system has been in place. Um, those are not insignificant numbers. Um, so, and again, this is a relatively new company. Um, I was concerned because obviously you read about these articles. I think the title was that it was boring, was ghosting all of these cities. But when you think about it, you know, projects are proposed all the time. Um, Public-private partnership projects, private partnership projects, whoever. Um, projects don't always come to fruition, is my point. And so for a relatively new company, um, they seem to be doing very well. Las Vegas seems to be very happy um, to expand this to almost, I think, 40 miles now. And as I said, 55 stations from the original five. Um, cost was a major concern to me. Too many variables, too many unknowns. But now in my most recent discussions with them and them saying that they will now um, basically identify, source, and fund this project, I have to say to myself, well, that's an interesting proposal. I mean, someone is coming to us, as long as we have the proper bonds in place, performance bonds, we have no risk, no liability, we need to have bonds to protect ourselves in terms of if this project starts and doesn't finish, then what happens? In other words, obviously, it will be up to us to protect ourselves for those kinds of bonds. But if someone is telling me, and if I remember correctly, 
this project with the twin tunnels that we were looking at in each direction, uh, we were looking at about an 80 to $100 million project for these tunnels from beach to downtown. So that's nothing to sneeze at. If someone's telling me we want to do this project, this is important to us to show people that we can make this project work in Florida, um, I have to consider that very, very, very carefully if someone's going to commit to funding a $100 million project in our city to help with mobility and to help with transportation. Uh, we talked about you know, other parts of uh, uh, areas that where we think we have more of a traffic problem. This for me was never an end all and be all beach to downtown. To me, this was always a test to see if this was doable and if people were going to respond to this because I agree with Commissioner Herbst. Um, to me, the airport, the seaport, but within our own city and our own jurisdiction, I see, I see a, a case for this eventually up Sunrise Boulevard. I see a case for this out to Lockhart. Uh, in other words, this to me will always be phase one, whether we are going to connect with the airport and the seaport to downtown. Um, you know, the county has been talking for decades about counting, uh, connecting the airport and seaport. I remember these conversations for more than 30 years about, oh, we have to connect the airport to the seaport for all of the cruise passengers coming to town. So I don't know when that's going to happen, if that's going to happen. But maybe we get a jump on it and we show them, look how this works. Um, because we do know that uh, from our experience in Las Vegas, they do these tunnels pretty quickly. It's amazing how fast this actually happens. So uh, again, so for me, this is not just the end all and be all from the beach to downtown, it's the beginning. Um, but also, I wanna just talk about this report that we're waiting for. And, and Commissioner Beasley Pittman, you're right, we don't have enough information, we have to have more. But that's exactly what this report is doing because what we've authorized is that expense to, to flesh out all of the details, uh, the geological details, uh, any other detail that we can possibly think of. Is this project doable? And that's what we're waiting. We don't know that yet, but I believe that that's, correct me if I'm wrong, city manager, but that's exactly what this report is going to tell us at the end of the day. Yeah, the feasibility and also final cost. Okay, final cost, which, but now is not such a priority for us anymore if we're not gonna be paying uh, anything towards this project. But for me, it's most important as Commissioner Beasley Pittman said, um, you know, we have different environmental conditions. We have salt, we have soil that's different. Uh, so again, that's really important. I will have to have a, a real sense of this can happen, that there is feasibility to this. But we've already committed to that feasibility study. I, I think it's really imperative that we continue that study um, and get to the point where we can say, can we do this or not? Um, you know, the cost of the study is a cost that we, we spend many times on many different things. Um, but again, if someone is telling me that they are going to take all responsibility for, for construction, operation, and maintenance of a $100 million transit system, which might just be the first phase in an overall system that can alleviate other traffic points, choke points in our city, I'm willing to hear more. I, I'm not willing to shut this down right now. Uh, we have to hear more. We have to do our due diligence. We have to read the final report. We have to hear from staff. We have to see if this can happen. At the end of the day, if it cannot happen, okay, it cannot happen. But uh, Steve, if there I is have a question. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Um, you had mentioned that you had spoke with Boeing about the comments in the news article. Did you speak with those cities that were cited? Did they respond to you about what was said? No, I did not reach out to them yet. Okay. I, have, I just haven't had that time. I, okay. I, I was away and I came back and I just wanted to get the answers at least from their perspective. Okay, and then that one other question for um, the city manager, um, for Greg. Um, the study, we know that we've been, we paid I believe two um, installments towards that. If we do not go forward with the study, if we stop, is there, will we have to pay the remaining balance for the study? No, it, the, the contract was set up with a um, payment milestones. So right now we've only been invoiced $50,000 and that invoice is being processed. 50,000 out of 375,000. Okay, so the, cold, the total cost for the study is 375,000. Right. Correct. Okay, and at this time we have paid 50,000. Correct. We're in process of paying. Yeah, in the process but, but of they've paying. they've invoiced us and we're, okay. we're, we're forward. 
paying that. And if we do decide not to move forward, we are not um, liable or responsible for paying the balance of that 375000 Correct. Thank you. Vice Mayor. <clears throat> Boy, going last, everybody says it's, uh, it's like being a candidate again. Uh, I can say, yeah, me too. Um, I agree with a lot of the sentiment that uh, Commissioner Herbst came up with a couple of things. Number one, um, uh, it's more of an amusement ride. I liken it to an eight-ticket Disney ride. Uh, it's very entertaining, uh, but it's not doesn't solve a transportation issue. Anybody who doesn't know what that is, ask your parents or grandparents about that. Um, number two, um, logistics. Um, you're taking one choke point. Um, you, somebody has to go down to the beach. They go through traffic, and they have to fight parking, and then once they get to their destination, they take out their umbrella and their lawn chair and everything. Um, you're adding three choke points there. Uh, first, they have to find parking. Then they have to uh, get in line and wait for you know, the transportation through the tunnel, which might or might not be uh, at capacity at certain events. But the third thing they didn't even talk about, once you get to the beach, everybody's dropped off at one point, and now they have to go north and south, a third Uber or some other transportation. All while no, there would be there would be shuttles. Well, you suppose you have to wait for a shuttle. I mean, whatever it is, is but each one of those you're going to have to load and unload your umbrella, your lawn chair, your cooler, and everything. And then on the way home, you're doing the same thing in reverse, only adding sweat and suntan lotion to all that thing. Um, <laughs> I um, probably the most important thing is my neighborhood. Uh, my neighborhood during the campaign, and I've spoken several times with neighborhood representatives. Um, my community does not want this. I mean, they made it clear to me that they don't want this project. And I think, like uh, Commissioner Beasley said, we're in 50,000. I think we should cut our losses and say, uh, you know, I, I don't think we should put any more uh, city dollars into this project at this point. That's my opinion. Mayor, right. could I uh, just um, balancing on two of the things that were, or actually three of the things that were said, because uh, I think they're important. So, uh, Commissioner Beasley Pittman mentioned reaching out to the cities involved. I think if we're going to have a balanced approach, we ought to be talking to each one of those cities. We, if we were hiring somebody and we were checking references, we would call everybody involved. So I, I think it was good that uh, Commissioner Glassman reached out to the company to get their side of it. I think that's important. I do have a lot of confidence in the Wall Street Journal's reporting, but uh, certainly there's always opportunities for different perspectives from both sides. Um, so I'd like to hear what the cities have to say. I think that would be very important for us going forward to have their perspective and, and contrast that with what the boring company says they view as the impediments. Certainly we know any time that we've gone into litigation with any of the vendors when we've canceled uh, contracts, um, we run into the same thing. So I think it's important to have both sides of those. Um, ben? The... Uh, you want to talk? You want to hear from Ben? Is that what you were saying? You I'm sorry. From, you want to hear from city staff? You want to hear from Ben? No, I, I would like a report from the city manager where they reach out to each one of the cities named in that Wall Street Journal article and get their opinion and bring that back to us. I don't need to uh, do that at today's conference, but I okay, think okay. I think I think we should. Get I, think it's, that. I think that's only fair. Yep. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the other issue, and I'll tie into Commissioner Sturman. So I grew up in New York City, and when I wanted to go to the beach, I took a bus to get there. Sometimes two. And you're absolutely right. It's incredibly painful at the end of the day to stand on a long line of people waiting to get onto that bus to go home. I remember I went, I lived in the Bronx and I used to go to Orchard Beach and there would be 150 to 200 people waiting for that bus at the end of the day. <clears throat> Take us longer to get on the bus than it took us to get home. So I echo that thought. It's a very unpleasant experience. And if I had any other way of getting to the beach when I was younger, I would have taken it. It would not have been a city bus. So I, I think that's... Uh, I think that's a very important um, concept that we need to think about. And, I th and, and Commissioner, I think it would be a good idea <clears throat> as we're educating ourselves and getting some feedback from those other uh, communities to maybe for each of you to go out to Las Vegas and see how this operates. Y the concern that was raised by the vice mayor of, of waiting in a long line, you know, that hasn't been the experience at the, at the Las Vegas site, uh, you know, all the things, a lot of the things that you talk about in the abstract sound uh, a, a concerning, but in reality, those aren't what are happening. Those things are not happening um, in in the uh, 
uh, system that's now currently in place in Las Vegas. So, but I think the utilization is different, Mayor. Um, sorry? I think the utilization is different. So, and again, going back on my experience of going to the beach as a kid, everybody goes spaced out, but we all leave at the same time. So, you know, when I've been in Vegas, I've done the monorail from from the various casinos to the others, and so in in mathematics they call this queuing theory, which is how people line up to do things. So. They don't all come at the same time to go from one casino to the next to the next. And also, you're not, you're not coming off the beach again in your bathing suit covered in sand, having been sunburnt and, and, and everything else. You're, you're dressed up, you're going out, you're going from one venue to the next. So the way that people line up and, and utilize that service is going to be completely different from how people are going to be coming back from the beach, where you spend a day there and then everybody leaves at you know, 4 o'clock in the afternoon at the same time. But one, one other thing I'd like to say, too, I want to get this out there, and I think this is important, uh, and this ties into what Commissioner Glassman said about how uh, former District Commissioner One Moritis wrote to the governor and, and uh, in favor of this project, and this ties back to our earlier conversation, is why isn't that in our list of legislative priorities? So we talk about how the legislative priorities were derived from previous comments from commissioners. Um, so I think if we're going to be pushing this project, um, that should be on our list of legislative priorities. If we're asking the governor to support a project, I think it should be part of a financial request too. And I'm just curious as to why it's not in there. I think for appropriations, you have to be shovel ready to go to the governor or to go to the legislature. And you need to know the amount. Yeah, you, 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 it's but not- But we could have gone for the feasibility study though, right? Yeah, but it's not, we don't, I don't think I have enough level of specificity to go to the legislature for an appropriations request on a project like this. But we went, so if I may, if, if we're putting, if, if we are committing $375,000 of city funds to a feasibility study, I think we could have asked the legislature for $375,000 for the feasibility study. I'll leave that up to staff. But Mayor, I just want to address something because Commissioner Herbst and Vice Mayor Sturman keep talking about the beach as a place that only people go to, to oil up and lie in the sun. I want, I want to remind everyone that our beach has become quite a destination for major events throughout the entire year. Not everybody is going to the beach to oil up and lie in the sun and schlep their paraphernalia and wonder what they're going to do with it. I would like to remind my colleagues that the beach is a very well-known destination for major, major concerts, major events. Look at how many events come to us at, for our approval on the beach. Restaurants, Restaurants shops, entertainment concerts, Tortuga, you know, you name it. So I, am, I cannot buy the argument that this is not going to be practical for people just to come to the beach that want to lie on the sand. That's not the case. That's not our city anymore. That might have been our city 30 years ago. It's not our city anymore. We have to start planning for the future. We have to start being a little bit more cutting edge, a little bit more forward thinking. We have to start planning. And if someone is paying for the entire bill, then I really want us to be thinking about it seriously. But again, People are going to be going from downtown to the beach and back and forth for a lot of reasons other than just lying in the sand. Mayor, um, could we hear from Ben Rogers if he could come and share if um, Rogers, even you to, to stand up, please? the point okay. what the county, if he has um, insight on to what the county had to say about this? Share, please. Give us some information. Yes, ma'am. Ben Rogers, Director of Transportation Mobility. Uh, so... We didn't go through the PowerPoint today, um, but I'm going to hit on a couple of notes there, and then I'll take any questions at the end. Okay. So as, as we've discussed today, the interim agreement was approved uh, over the summer, and it was, in, it was designed with four milestones or deliverables. The first one was the alternatives analysis, which has been completed, and that's the $50,000 that we're processing the invoice right now. The alternatives analysis focused on the utilities, the route alignment, station locations, future connections, public and private as built neighborhood engagement, emergency access shafts, right-of-way boundaries, depth profiles, future conflicts like the Intercoastal Waterway and the Henry E. Kenny Tunnel, uh, just to name a few. So as a staff, we did a lot of behind the scenes, going through paperwork, working with the boring company, and we had a lot of weekly calls with them trying to figure out what the preferred route would look like. We came to the commission in September and provided some uh, feedback on that and, and asked for direction on stop locations, and we came up with four stop locations, one at Esplanade Park, one near the Riverwalk Center Garage downtown, one near uh, the heart of the Las Olas Shops District, probably on 8th in Las Olas, um, and then one out on the Promenade Park out on the Barrier Island. And so the second milestone 
uh, is focused on geotechnical. So that's your, your subsurface ground conditions and what does it take to, to bore through and how do we get a tunnel from point A to point B. And we are getting ready to initiate that milestone in December. They were scheduling uh, some of their uh, some consultants to do some of the drilling, and we stopped them based off of some of the uh, holiday schedules and the events that were in the downtown area. So they were scheduled for uh, that work to start in January. Uh, but with the concerns that we heard from the commission in early December, we asked them to hold that, uh, and we suspended all the efforts and the project uh, after hearing the concerns from the commission. So right now, we're between milestone one and milestone two, uh, if we would keep, keep going or move forward. Milestone three, uh, once they get geotechnical work done, they can better define the, the plans and the station designs. Uh, in September, we talked about the differences between the station types, between at surface and below surface, and the use of real estate, uh, and how we balance the cost and efficiencies of that. Uh, and so what they would do then, and we've already started some of it, is just do some early designs and feasibility of what those stops would look like and how they would feel to the community. And then the last one, uh, as the city manager uh, noted, is just to deliver the final cost estimate and to kind of wrap, it, uh, wrap the package together and have something uh, that can be further evaluated and understood by the commission. Ben, I have a question. In my conversations with Boring, um, I asked, like my colleagues had asked today, why are we paying for uh, the study? And the answer I got back was, you're really not paying for the whole study, that this study will cost more than the 375000 So are we able to ascertain what, what the total cost is and how much boring is actually contributing to the overall study at the end of the day? Or can we ask that question? Because again, um, I, 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 at least I have been told that that is not the total cost of what this will take. That's my understanding as well. Uh, I wasn't involved in the early negotiations with the boring company. That was a previous city manager. But my understanding is correct that that's why we capped ours at not to exceed 375, but they, ex they expected the costs and the investment to be more than that. Right. But I think it's important for us to know exactly how much because I'd like to know how much of that total cost we are shouldering. Uh, but again, I'm just going to go back to the fact that if, if I have to spend you know, $375,000 to get $100 million, um, I'm in that game all day. Continue, please, can, Mr. Rogers. Please. Yep, and so on the, on the next slide, it was really just, again, recapping that we suspended all project efforts, that we've been in communication with the Boring Company, and we've identified that we do owe them $50,000 for services performed to date. Uh, we talked to them about some of the concerns the commission had and what the next steps look like. Uh, they've had conversations with the city manager, and I'd have to defer to him on exactly uh, what the next steps look like in his opinion. But I understand, uh, as, as was previously mentioned, that there's, co there's a conversation about the boring company uh, incurring or, or taking on some of the costs. So, Mayor, just as you uh, alluded to, um, the boring company is committed to fully funding the capital expenditures to complete this project. They find um, that this is a very important um, system for them, mm -hmm. and um, they um, want to continue uh, the remaining portion of the contract um, so that they can uh, then understand the total cost, the feasibility, and all the requirements for uh, building the system. And um, so there are two options right now. The commission um, can um, continue the the study and as is, and uh, and and again, the, we would have an amendment uh, to include that they will take the burden of developing the financial plan and the capital plan for constructing it without the city commissions, uh, without the city spending anything uh, for that construction. Or um, the other option is to end the feasibility study and not continue the project further. Well, it seems that most of the voices I've been hearing on this commission have spoken to the need for more information. And um, uh, and so I would encourage the commission to direct the city manager to continue with the investigation process of this. Otherwise, we're making decisions without really having all the information. Um, anyone else want to comment on that? I have a question. Greg, what is your opinion about this project? So uh, what I can tell you is that this, um, I was very skeptic before going out to Las Vegas. And when I went to Las Vegas, I saw a potential that could bring uh, a system to transport people um, quickly from one place to another. 
two months ago we had, I believe it was the Oasis Festival on the beach. I think it was the Oasis Festival. Odyssey. And Odyssey, thank you. You're Odyssey welcome. Festival. And um, the Odyssey Festival was using the parking garages in downtown and they were shuttling people in buses to the beach back and forth. We are having a demand for events almost every month now. In fact, we now have St. Patrick's that is proposing to do a, uh, the parade on the beach. Uh, and because of capacity, we're trying to stay on downtown. So what I can say is that there are projects like the International Swimming Hall of Fame, there is DC Alexander Park, there is streetscape improvements on A1A that is going to create more, um, uh, it's going to bring more people, forecast to bring more people to visit the beach because it is the longest beach in South Florida because it has so many popular venues um, it's going to be very attractive. You have uh, also the water taxi looking at enhancing options of bringing people back and forth. I mean, just to give you an idea, 88,000 people are moved in the water taxi during the boat show during that week, 88,000 people. So uh, because there's a lot of demand in the Barrier Island, this can present an opportunity to move people back and forth for those events so people enjoy the beach back and forth while minimizing traffic in the middle Las Olas region area. Mr. Payer, uh, I think that we shouldn't spend any more money on this, at least until after we've had a chance to speak to those, those other cities and see what's going on. I mean, it might just be wasted money. I think that we should put a hold on it for now. That's my thought. Well, what do the, what do the rest of you feel? I mean, obviously we need, we, we should find out more information. There's no doubt about that. But, um, I mean, my opinion is that it makes it makes sense to continue with the analysis and the investigation, and we can we can chew and walk, chew gum and walk at the same time by uh, doing that, as well as consulting with these other cities uh, and finding out uh, what the hiccups were in their communities. Um, you know. Well, there's no urgency aligned with this if we um, take the time to um, not put any more money into it get the information, at least be able to fairly review it and come to a um, decision that will benefit the city. I agree, I don't think any more money needs, no more money needs to go into this at this point without the review of the reports. All right, so, uh, and Commissioner Herbs, you agree with that? Um, yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I don't wanna spend any more money. I'm also concerned about staff time though, because staff is not free, so, I'd like to understand the resources that we're devoting internally towards this because that, that cost could be quite substantial. But I'll also comment on one other thing, Greg. I think you make a good point, and Commissioner Glassman, you did this too. I agree with you that there are certain events that this would certainly benefit. And again, if we had gotten a business plan and a market analysis from Boring Company, they would have outlined that in there. So again, I think that's a condition precedent to even beginning any conversation is, I want a business plan from the boring company. You know, this is something that, that they should have done their due diligence before we even had a preliminary conversation. And I'm disappointed that I don't have anything to look at that would give me some sense of what the utilization might be. But to your point, um, uh, Mr. City Manager, whenever I go to those events, I do take the water taxi. I would not get into a tunnel underground. Taking the water taxi is why I live in Fort Lauderdale, being on the water is why I'm here. I take it not because I don't want to drive, I take it because I enjoy the trip. You know, the getting there is half the fun. So when I go out to concerts, when I go to the boat show, when I go to any event at the beach that is going to be crowded, I always take the water taxi. And again, when I have folks coming in from out of town that participate with me, taking the water taxi is half our day uh, because that's the most pleasurable aspect sometime of going out to these events. So I don't think that the tunnel is a replacement or the water taxi, and I think uh, I think to to suggest that it might be, you know, is um, not quite accurate. Uh, again, people people take the water taxi for the experience, not just to get from point A to point B. And and I want to clarify, if I may, I'm not saying or expressing that it is a substitute. I'm just saying that looking at the demand, there's going to be a lot more events. The the beach is going to look a lot more attractive. 
and you know the the water taxi is looking at that forecast they are pursuing in beefing up their operations uh, on how they can improve the transport um, so this uh, coincides with a strategy of looking at the future and meeting up with the demand it's a it's a several pronged approach to our transportation and mobility issues um, because I will go further than just events. It's not even just events anymore. It's, it's just on a daily basis. Anyone that spends any time on our beach on a regular basis will know that people are coming. They don't even need an event. They're coming, and they're not even just coming just to sit on the beach. They're coming for a variety of things. They're coming to swim now in our brand new pools. They're coming for the, all of the restaurants, shops, you name it, they're coming because the beach is a destination for our entire city and for all of our visitors. So, you know, some might like be like Commissioner Herbst wants to take a water taxi. Some people might be seasick and might rather be in a tunnel. So you know, vice vice mayor vice mayor says uh, vice mayor says it's a Disney ride. Some people might say, hey, I want to check out that Disney ride. So you know, everyone is different. What I'm saying is, this is a city that needs to show citizens and visitors that we have more than one option. We just have to make all of these different options available. So to me, this is just a piece of that puzzle. It's not the so end all. why don't we let the city manager contact these other communities, report back to us, and then we can see where we want to go from there, if at all. All right? Yeah. We can do that. OK, great. OK, but there are two people who signed up to speak. Um, uh, Susan Peterson, are you still here? Hi, Susan. A couple minutes, please. And then uh, uh, Michael Ray. Hello, my name is Susan Peterson. I live in River Oaks. And just before I came here, I was swimming in the ocean. I swim in the ocean or the pool almost every day. I'm from the Bronx, too, and I used to swim at Orchard Beach. And Commissioner Glassman, I'm very glad that you mentioned the Baltimore Tunnel, because years ago, I was with my fiance, and I said, let's take the bridge. I hate getting stuck in tunnels. I said, no, 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 let's take the tunnel. We were stuck down in that tunnel in a traffic jam with an accident for about an hour, breathing exhaust. It was like a nightmare. I came to Fort Lauderdale from the Bronx because this is paradise for me. And um, I really would encourage the commissioners to consider putting a stop to this project right away. Um, you mentioned sand and suntan oil. What about baby poop and puke if they get in the original into the, uh, into the cars? I see this as you know, the idea that some company owned by one of the former richest men in the world who is acting very unstable lately is going to be some kind of a done deal. It's something that really bothers me. Also, the reference to Las Vegas. Don't be seduced by Las Vegas. Who pays for the trips to Las Vegas? I, don't, I think it's apples and oranges. Las Vegas is Las Vegas. Fort Lauderdale is a very special place. And I came here for the air, the nature, the sea. And of course, we're developing. But I don't see why anybody would want to go down into a tunnel. It's, you know, it's scary. And also, the mention by Mr. Rogers about, well, the safety exits. I don't think it's a safe thing. We have the porous limestone geology here. And I think it's just a terrible idea. I think it was unfortunate the way it was pushed through in the previous commission. And I would encourage the commissioners to put a stop to it right now. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you. Mayor, just, a, just a his, one little quick historical note. I would just urge everyone to read all of the articles um, from the newspaper when the Kinney Tunnel was proposed in our city. Um, many of the arguments now that I'm hearing also and that many problems uh, just read the history of our own Kinney Tunnel, uh, read the controversy that that tunnel created, and just think about it in terms of some of the things we're hearing today. I think you'll find some interesting parallels um, because there was an amazing amount of controversy when the uh, Kinney Tunnel was uh, built. And uh, I think that people now today would say, well, thank goodness we built the Kinney Tunnel. So just want to mention a little historical fact. Thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Oh. Two things. I don't think the tunnel is significantly, there's no evidence to show it's going to solve any traffic problems. And second, no money should be spent anymore. I said that at the last hearing. At that time, 
Uh, Elon Musk was the richest man in the world. Now he's only the second richest man in the world. Uh, but why should we pay for him to do a study, to do a business where he's going to make profit? The richest man in the world just doesn't make sense. Well, he's the second richest, so he's got to cut but, corners. Oh, yeah, yeah. He needs yeah, more yeah. money now. <laughs> but I've been reading a lot of my own and Google and Wikipedia and other articles. And you mentioned some uh, incidents like in Baltimore. And I'm not vouching for the veracity of what I read, but you can find a lot of this online. And what I saw in Baltimore was that the governor granted a permit in 2017, but they never started the job. They just abandoned the project. Also, the first Hyperloop tunnel in Hawthorne, California, is now, guess what? A parking lot. Uh, I read Ontario, Canada was looking for other bids. Again, maybe, obviously, more information is needed. Speak in, speak in the microphone. Yes, more information is needed. And in the Wikipedia, it says, Musk's plant tunnels have also been criticized for lacking such safety features as emergency exit corridors, ventilation systems, or fire suppression. And the point is, if they want to pay the money to do this, fine. But the city, the taxpayers, should not have to foot the bill for the richest, uh, second richest person in the world. And also, how, how many vehicles are there going to be saved if there are a tunnel? I mean, who's gonna, have there have been any studies on that? Who's right. going to use it? And, if you, and the second reason I said is that it's not going to stop traffic is because if you only want to stop traffic, you don't build high rises at the old Sears Tower or the, it's already like a parking lot when you drive there. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, so we'll wait to hear back from you, Mr. City Manager. Okay, okay. very good. We'll do that. Uh, moving on to business two, uh, year in review. All right, yes, um, so we, 2022 was a very busy year. Um, uh, upon the goal setting uh, opportunity that we had at the beginning of the year, uh, staff continued pursuing priorities of the commission and now staff is going to present some highlights of the wins and accomplishments that took place and were delivered. We're also going to share uh, an outlook on the projections for finance, for our financial performance and grants performance. And this can also help provide you with, um, invoke some, um, some thought about how you can provide input uh, for the um, goal setting, uh, commission goal setting uh, opportunity that will take place on January 26th. Um, so this is, this is kind of like a kickoff for that. And for that, we have Erica um, that will start the conversation. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Commissioners. As Greg said, I'm Erica Johnson. I'm in the Office of Management and Budget, and I'm going to be presenting today with my colleague, Yvette Matthews. Um, and we're going to start off by talking a little bit about um, some of the end of your reports. I'll refer you to the attachments because there was a lot of work that was done over the course of the past year, and I'm only going to hit a few highlights this afternoon but the end of year annual strategic plan annual progress report, the end of year budget projection and the grants review provide a lot of good information. That being said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our progress on our five-year strategic plan goals. Our strategic plan was adopted in 2019. It is a five-year plan, so we are on the second half of that plan. Uh, we have eight goals that are organized into six focus areas, infrastructure, public places, neighborhood enhancement, business development, public safety and internal support. In infrastructure, uh, this past year, we've replaced multiple undersized and deteriorating water mains, upgraded and rehabilitated pump stations and force mains, and began improvements in the River, Wo River Oaks and Edgewood neighborhoods um, as identified in our stormwater master plan. We also began construction of our utility undergrading projects in the Los Olas Isles. Um, and uh, do we have the presentation up on the screen? There's a photo of a few of you breaking ground on that key project, so I wanted to make sure that everyone can see that uh, great work. Um, also, in terms of uh, transportation lens of infrastructure, we completed repairs to the Westlake Drive Bridge. We launched a successful micro mover uh, pilot project, which is helping to with mobility downtown and along the beach. And we com completed improvements to 15th Avenue. Uh, which has helped with traffic calming and pedestrian safety. 
And of course, we have to mention the adoption of the Lauder Trail Master Plan and the Los Olas Mobility Master Plan. Under public places this year, we are excited to announce that we've completed renovations to the Aquatic Center and opened the Dive Tower. Uh, we've also, with the infusion of the $200 million Parks Bond, uh, completed the design of seven parks with e AECOM um, and are nearing completion of the Tunnel Top Park above Henry E. Ken Henry e. Kenny Tunnel. We also acquired four new parks, one in each district, or I shouldn't say parks, green spaces, uh, that are open to the public to come and enjoy. And we have upgraded lighting in seven parks, moving away from the older metal halide lighting to new energy efficient LED lighting. Um, we've also installed multiple public works of art. You can see pictured on the screen uh, the sculpture, uh, the Brito sculpture that was generously donated to the city and is available uh, at Hardy Park. We also wrapped four lifeguard towers, uh, which help to create a sense of place, but also are more visible should you ever need emergency assistance while you're down there. Uh, and of course, we can't talk about public places without talking about our 165 miles of navigable waterways. Uh, one of the priorities identified at last year's prioritization workshop was to ensure that the, those waterways are clean and safe. And so we're actually, we've installed aeration devices which improve circulation and oxygenation um, concentrations in Tarpon River, Lake Melva, Cliff Lake, and Hemershe Canal. I'd point out that while all of these are installed, we're still waiting on power hookups from FPNL until those are fully operational. And then we also completed a restoration project in Tarpon River, which removed over 2,000 cubic yards of sediment. Uh, so a lot of work just in public places. And neighborhood enhancement, our focus of the last year has really been on affordable housing and homelessness. Um, so we've, of course, we've uh, continued our community court program, and this year we saw 16 program graduates, and we served another 775 walk-ins. Um, those are people that have come in on their own to seek services. Um, in terms of preventing people from under, ever entering homelessness, uh, we implemented a new affordable housing policy, which incentivizes additional affordable housing units in return for greater density and or height for those development projects. And then we rehabilitated 16 housing units, making sure that those homes are continue to be safe, habitable, and affordable for residents that are currently living in them. And then we provided rental assistance for another 577 residents. So a lot of great work to both address homelessness and prevent individuals from ever entering. In terms of business development, we've taken great strides this last year to focus on diversifying our economy, and we're excited with the approval of a comprehensive agreement for a new full-service movie studio in our city. The Community Redevelopment Agency also continues to provide projects incentives to reduce uh, slum and improve economic health in their target areas. On the screen, you can see the new YMCA on Cistrunk Boulevard, where we're actually going to be having our prioritization workshop later this month, uh, which was in part uh, built due to uh, CRA dollars. And in fact, between 2017 and 2023, which we're now in, the CRA has funded over $34 million for completed projects alone. Another positive outcome of this year was that our taxable values increased citywide by $6 billion. Of this, $1.6 billion was associated with new construction, which really shows our efforts towards economic revitalization and development. Uh, overall, this will pr uh, generate $22 million in additional revenue, which has allowed us to maintain our millage rate for the 16th consecutive year. And of course, we have to talk about public safety if we're going to be talking about our five-year strategic plan. This last year, we're moving forward and have completed the design for the new police headquarters. You can see the rendering on the screen. Um, and we've also, in terms of our fire rescue, are moving forward with an innovative approach. We're moving forward with the purchase and installation of a prefabricated building for our EMS substation uh, 88, which will, is expected to reduce costs. And then we've added a lot of staffing this past year. We've added 17 new police officers to reestablish the neighborhood action teams. We've added two new fire rescue positions for an integrated health program, which seeks to reduce the number of calls for service we receive. We've added 15 new fire rescue positions for the new EMS substation once it's open. And then we're also enhancing after hours code enforcement, specifically to ad address noise and vacation rentals, among other code concerns. So we've added four new positions for that as well. 
And then lastly, I'd just like to mention some of the work that we've taken in internal support. These are really the things that guide our organization, um, considering finance, human resources, our technology systems. And this year, we're proud to say that Standard & Poor's has assigned a AAA rating to our general obligation bonds and special obligation refunding bonds that really shows this, the confidence in our financial management. We've launched the finance and procurement modules of our enterprise resource planning system. And we've implemented innovative recruitment strategies. We see across, across all industries challenges in recruitment. And so our city's taking a new method, a new approach um, to implement a national marketing campaign of which we would put billboards in other major metropolitan areas to attract them to sunny South Florida. And with that, I will hand it over to Yvette Matthews. Erica, Yvette Matthews, Budget CIP and Grants Division Manager. Um, normally when we present our quarterly projections, we're looking forward. Q4 is the one time a year where we actually look backwards and it really helps us to understand our overall fiscal performance for the year, which helps to set the tone as we enter into the next year's budget development. Um, I know you just adopted the last budget, but we're already kicking off for the next year. I'm pleased to announce that there were no major challenges over the year. Um, our general fund revenues came in at 99.5% of what we budgeted, which really sets the tone as we enter into the next year. Um, our major shortfall this year in terms of revenues was actually interest earnings, which I'm sure we've all encountered. Um, in terms of expenses, we used 97.5, or we're projecting to use 97.5% of the general fund um, expenditure budget for the year. Again, these are just our initial projections. We get the final audited information from our um, external auditors once they've completed their review. As we look at the budget, the, one of the key indicators is our general funds fund balance. Um, when we started the year, we had, as an, the audited number was 108 point uh, $8 million in general funds uh, balance. As we are ending the year, we're projecting to end at about $102 million. On the screen, you see some of our larger uses throughout the year. Um, the good news here is that we're ending the year above, or we're projecting to end the year above our 25% target, um, which is a strong indicator of our uh, fiscal health for the year. And it also provides some additional flexibility as um, unexpected incidences or uh, key projects come out throughout the year. And finally, as we look at our grants year in review, the first question that we are asked anytime we enter into a large project is, is there a grant for that? And one of the things that we really wanted you to be able to see is that staff are very actively and strategically going after grants. Uh, we applied for 45 different grants over the last fiscal year, received 27, which totaled $16.8 million. Um, just to give you an idea, we requested $65 million in grants. And sometimes it takes up to two years before we actually see the fruit of some of that labor. So with some of the larger infrastructure grants that were released over the last year or two, um, it may be a while before we actually receive notice that the applications submitted were awarded. Uh, we seek grants throughout the city. Every, almost every department within the city uh, is seeking grants from parks, uh, trying to use park bond funds as a match for some of the larger projects to really um, enhance the projects that they're able to do. Within public works, uh, we seek funds for everything from stormwater projects. And one of our biggest awards last year was the $10.5 million Durs Neighborhood Stormwater Project. Public Safety received a grant for illegal gun crime prevention and reduction. Um, and then everything from after school programs or after school snacks or summer food programs that really enhance the projects and programs that we're already doing across the city. So we just wanted to provide this uh, quick overview of all of the reports that you get to hear about the activity that staff are doing throughout the year and provide an opportunity for you all to ask any questions related to any of these reports. I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, what efforts are being made to perhaps tap into the federal infrastructure uh, f funds in order to assist the city in 
funding its water treatment plant. Do you know? Do you have any information on that, or is that someone else that would be able to answer that question? Um, so I can provide a high level, and then if you want more detailed, we can um, bring up staff. So we actually work hand in hand with um, Daphne and our federal lobbyists. So Daphne and the federal lobbyists are really actively looking at some of the the funding that is available. Staff then reviews those opportunities and determines whether or not it's something that fits into. Um, the various projects that we have, and then we actively pursue those. Within Public Works, uh, we actually, for the first time this year, have a new grants person specifically for Public Works to actively seek out those grants. And so what we're doing every quarterly when we meet um, as a team is we look at all the funding announcements. We try to look at what programs are we going to go after and be strategic about how we'll go after them. Okay, but do you see this as a uh, priority of the city to be able to go after infrastructure money, federal infrastructure money for our water treatment plant? Um, do you so, know if that's on the table? Has anyone researched it? Is that an answer you can get back to us with at some point? We definitely can. I don't know if, Alan, you want to... If you don't know the answer today, that's yeah. okay. But since we'll get back you, since you, you brought the subject up... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can tell you, any large project that we have, we do actively seek funding for it, but we can get back with specifics on that one. Okay, if you can get back to us on that, that would appreciate mm -hmm. that. Great, thank you. Anyone else have any questions of city staff? Awesome, hey, thank you guys. Nice. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Okay, the uh, next item of business, which is uh, the last business item, is pickleball design at Snyder Park. We have a number of people who sign up to speak. But before we do that, um, who's going to give the presentation? Uh, is it staff or is it the uh, applicant? Ellen Bogdan, if you want to come up here and uh, tell us. Now, the city, the commission has approved this project. The comprehensive agreement has been signed. And today, the purpose of today is for you to present to the commission and to the community what your design is going to look like as you're proposing it and the uh, commission and the community to respond to that. Perfect. Mayor, commissioners, uh, Ellen Bogdanoff for MPI. Um, we are here today to kind of go over uh, the concept and plan and get some feedback uh, from all of you as to whether or not you kind of like what we're doing here. Um, we're anxious to move forward. We did have a pre-application meeting, uh, and it went well, and we have the comments from staff to incorporate into our first site plan uh, submission. Um, and just as a, a, a note of um, for, for you all, this is our um, 11th public meeting uh, to discuss and to present um, pickleball. Um, just quickly, we're going to go through the quick history, existing conditions on the site, the proposed site plan, proposed use area breakdown, and then we will give you some renderings as to what we would like this, uh, the, the look and feel of the project. <clears throat> just briefly, and I'm sure you all have, have seen this, basically um, all of this is 1914 Snyder construct, construction was founded. Uh, in 1966, uh, the city acquired Snyder Park property from Byron Snyder, but it was actually his corporation. Snyder Park officially opens in 1973 and obtains a permit for the transfer station in 2001. And in 2022, the goal is to repurpose an area of the park, which just for informational purposes is zoned park, not conservation, the area that we're talking about. There are areas of Snyder Park that are conservation areas based on the county um, designation, but the area that we're looking at is park and things such as baseball and tennis and all kinds of active sports are, are permitted in that zoning. This is what it looked like in 1947. The area that you'll see is pretty much the rock quarry. Um, didn't change too much. A little bit of vegetation uh, grew in that area. This is when it was kind of a little bit more active where you had the beach, um, where the citizens used the beach, and then ultimately it was closed. And then the, you, you start to see the, um, on, on, the, on the bottom, that's the train, trans, the train station. Uh, this is 2019. Again, there's the large grassy area, which is a percentage 
<clears throat> excuse me, five, approximately five acres are currently inaccessible to the public. The open space that you see are three acres of open space where they usually have their concerts. Um, it is predominantly weeds, sand, and sometimes things that people leave behind. So, so the facility to the left is the county uh, alcohol and drug treatment center? The, are you talking about the big white building there? Big white building. What that is that? That is a manufacturer. I believe that's a defense contractor and a manufacturer. Um, the, there, to the north is where you have Nova, um, but that is a private owner. And then the lot there um, next to it, I believe, is owned by the same people. So where the big white uh, structure is, that's uh, a private enterprise? Correct. Okay. And they, do they own all that, all that land that's around it, that, the, where the parking lot is, and I guess the sort of the, the, the greenish area to the bottom and to the top, is that all owned by the private enterprise? Yeah, it's my understanding it's all owned by the same folks. Okay, and um, and on the north side of your circle, that's that's uh, a lake area, a pond area? That's the lake that was closed. Uh, that was the one that was used as the beach. It is not the dog lake. The dog lake is, uh, is to the east right, of that. Right, I know that. So... Uh, and this is the beach area that, that is currently closed by the city? It's closed. It's pretty, when you go there, you look at it, it's got a couple of palm trees that were there, and it's it's uh, some a lot of sand, but weeds growing through it because they really haven't maintained it as a beach. All right. And to the south, that's 595? 595, and the airport's on the other side. And then the area that you'll see that's to the, the kind of that L-shaped is where you have the property which houses the seaweed mound and then the back of the house for Parks and Rec. There's a lot of parking, um, there's a lot of staging, um, and you have the trash transfer station back there as well, and that's where the trucks enter through Perimeter Road in the back. And then to the far right on the corner of the beach where you'll see that area, you have the bathrooms that have been condemned and closed. Okay, thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's okay. These are the existing conditions of the project site based on where you have all of your buildings. These are the bathrooms, there's the transfer station, um, and the, the, you have the roadway there for the transfer station. Just more conditions of the site. You'll see the disc golf, that, that mound that's there, that's actually the seaweed mound. more conditions of the site. Uh, and this is a view of, of the beach area. You'll see there is sand there, but it hasn't really been maintained as a beach. So the weeds have grown, uh, grown through it and the palm trees are there as well. This is the proposed site plan. It hasn't really changed very much from the initial uh, plan that we had showed the commission. Um, and we have a, the lake house bar, the storage service area, the entry um, the welcome, because everybody would be coming on Perimeter Road and coming up 9th, and then you would have the entry welcome center. Center Court is obviously where Center Court is, and there's and, and there's, there's going to be a building there which will house the locker rooms and some community rooms and other things that are needed. Um, championship pickleball courts are going to be, we, we have in the CA, as you remember, we wanted to make sure that they were regulation size uh, pickleball courts. There's um, a view up at the right, the blue ones are paddle, which is actually the, one of the fastest growing sports um, internationally. Um, the entranceway where is that yellow building to the south, which is ab abuts the parking lot area. And we are going to be putting in some covered courts. Part of the feedback that we've been getting in the community is what do they really need? And a lot of people feel like, especially in midday, it gets very hot sometimes in the summer. Um, we know that you know some of the commissioners like shade. So um, we're going to go ahead and uh, we have several courts that are going to be covered. So just to give you a proposed breakdown, the pro shop is 5,400 square feet. Uh, the central court building is 12,000, but it's two stories. So the footprint is only about 6,000 square feet. The lake house is 2,700 square feet, which will serve as the restaurant to service the pickleball community. Um, the maintenance building is 3,000 square feet, entry pavilion is 2,200 square feet, and we have a kayak rental pavilion for 829 square feet. And this is basically the look and feel of what we're trying to create on that location. Um, <clears throat> reactivating the beach, making sure that people can have water sports on the beach. We want an open air, kind of like what you see at Birch State Park in the restaurant there. It's kind of like a, a beach feel. 
Um, and there's going to be a lot of greenery. We're actually putting in a lot more green than currently is at that at that space. It was never really a lot of vegetation there. Uh, the vegetation that was planted was actually planted to um, hide or you know create a barrier for the um, seaweed mound. And these are just some more pictures and renderings of the look and feel uh, that we are going for. Our architects did an excellent job, kind of giving you a uh, not only a bird's eye view, but also as you're walking through, we want it to be lush. Some of the feedback has been they want to make sure there's a lot of trees and bushes uh, for the, the birds and the butterflies, um, and we've created that look and feel um, on, the, um, on the courts. And that's basically it. Okay, anyone have any questions of uh, Ms. Bogdanoff? Otherwise, we have a number of people who have signed up to speak. Uh, Commissioner Herbst? So I had spoken with Ms. Bogdanoff um, yesterday, and we were just talking about this in general. So, um, and I want to hear her perspective on the issue related to the deed restrictions. So I think that's an important one. I know I've seen what our city, previous city attorney has put out. I'd like your perspective on the concept of the deed restriction, the, as I shared with you, um, sort of the, uh, the intent of the donation and respecting that. So I'd like a just a thorough discussion of that, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Herbst, thank you. And I, I, I appreciated the call. Um, we had given the city an opinion letter um, from one of the attorneys that, when she was a legislator, wrote a lot of the MARTA law, which basically addressed whether or not there was a deed restriction and when it would expire, because the, the state believes that there should not be restrictions in perpetuity. The restriction is no business purposes on this land. Her opinion was that it had extinguished because it was uh, it was not renewed, and the corporation that owned it and it wasn't gifted. Just to, to be clear, it was um, it would you paid three hundred and fifty thousand in today's dollars. That's probably close to four million dollars. The city paid. It was a rock quarry when they received it. Um, so the a um, it it is her opinion that it was extinguished and it no longer exists. But assuming that it does exist. We go back to the language. Nobody really knew what he meant by business purposes. Arguably, if it's not defined, it was never stated specifically, this is to remain a passive park. When the city zoned it, and you had the conservation areas, and then you had all of the other areas of the park, the city zoned it um, park. And recreational activities are permitted, as noted by the fact that you installed disc golf. You actually, at one point, had baseball playing there. Um, you had a lot of other activities, but it was never, you were never able to completely activate the park. There's articles going back to the 80s trying to figure out what you can do to be, bring people to the park. So arguably, it is our position that even if it, it did exist, which we don't believe it does, it qualifies because everything we're doing is in the park zoning code. And there is nothing in the deed that talks about passive, nature preserve, none of that. If it said, we want to maintain this as a nature preserve, then arguably you, you, there would, you wouldn't want this. It talks about natural vegetation, but there was never natural veg vegetation in that area because it was a rock quarry. And everything that was put there was basically, and if you go back to some of these pictures and you look at even the current picture, you'll see that the, that was the, a lot of this was planted. There's not, it's not the lush part of Snyder Park, especially that part of Snyder Park that's a con conservation area. But the city has installed in a lot of the area um, active sports. Uh, you have disc golf being one. I think it was just a couple weeks ago. You had over a thousand people come to the park to watch a tournament, and one of the guys is probably the best known in the in the country. So everybody came to watch him play. Um, this is just another amenity. Um, it's pickleball. It's not disc golf. It's not baseball. It's pickleball, and it is actually. Um, I think the last statistic. We're actually worthy enough of a statistic. Thirty-four million people in 2022 played pickleball in the country. Thank you. And so what I'd like now, and I appreciate that, um, I had the opportunity to go down there and walk the site this morning, and there were actually three groups of people playing, uh, playing the uh, Frisbee disc game. So it was interesting. I didn't expect to see that on a 10 o'clock on a, on a Tuesday morning, but apparently it is utilized in, during the week. So that was nice to see. I was, I was pleased to see that. 
but now I'd like sort of the perspective from our city attorney's office on, on some of those same issues, if you will. And, and, and as well, I understand that our city charter says that it requires a unanimous vote to lease out anything that's park property. I think it's section 8.21. So if you could address that, as well as the comments made by Ms. Bogdanoff regarding passive use, active use, park, and the deed restrictions, just so I could hear what, what the city's position on that is as well. Thank you. So we, our office did have an opportunity to review the letter from um, Katie Edwards uh, Warpole with regards to her opinion of the extinguishment of that restrictive covenant. Uh, the issue, we disagree with her in the sense that the, her, the letter uh, references an agreement from Mr. Snyder that speaks to the deed restriction but then the deed itself contains the actual deed restriction. They're referring to the Marketable Record Title Act as providing for the distinguishment of the restriction, which cites that that document has to be recorded, the document that contains the restriction has to be recorded before the root title. In this case, the root title contains the restriction. We've gone back and forth trying to explain that distinction. Um, I don't think we've come to terms or an agreement with that, but our opinion still remains the same. The restriction is in the root title, recorded in the root title, and still is effective as far as a restrictive covenant. Uh, the use of the park use has been determined by the office, or the proposed use is consistent with uh, a park use on the property as understood within our land development codes and within our uh, comprehensive plan. So our office initially, when this uh, proposal came forward, did not have any issue with the proposed use as meeting the park use. Um, with regards to the restriction to the lease of park land, that's generally uh, associated with land that is zoned park, but I'll bring up that uh, charter provision to make sure that um, consistent with uh, the actual language of that, if you give me a moment to do so. Okay. Right. Any further questions? Not right now. I may come back for more. I'll reserve my right to ask more as time goes on. I want some more. You feedback. used up all your time. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. Commissioner Beasley Pittman. Um, let, allow me to wait a moment if you go to the other commissioners. Okay, sure. Commissioner Glassman. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. I don't have any um, any questions on the design at all. I think it's uh, all encompassing. I was, I guess, I didn't remember originally. Was was paddle always included in this design before paddle courts? Initially, no. They had put um, they had put in that section. I think there were um, more pickleball courts, so they just exchanged them out. If that's something ultimately, you know that. You know, DRC and the commission says no, we don't want paddle. But there was a, a request, a request for it when we went out into the community. People says, you know, if you're going to put in bocce ball and you're going to put in beach volleyball and kayaking, we'd like a couple of paddle ball courts because it's something that we like to play as well. So we're just that's part of the feedback we got from the. We community. have four paddle and how many pickleball? Forty-one. Forty-one plus four. Correct. Okay, great. Um, at what point in time? The only negativity I'm hearing, and also at my pre-agenda meeting. Um, I'm, I'm hearing support for the project, uh, and I'm also hearing, though, that there's a concern about the midnight hour opening till. That's the only thing, and I know that we're only supposed to really be talking about design today. Right. Uh, correct? Because uh, that was part of our comprehensive agreement that we would see this design before it went to DRC, so that's what we're doing now. But right. I just had that one question as we move forward and as this heads to DRC, I just maybe if you guys could just talk about that a little bit, because that's... It's late for a lot of people, um, so I, right. that was my, that's my only concern. Well, we're finding that you know pickleball players are a little fanatical. They like to play twenty four seven if they could. Um, <laughs> but uh, the the CA agreement basically says six in the morning till twelve at night. It doesn't necessarily mean that's when we're going to be open. It was just within the within the agreement. It was a range of time we could be. And the reason we did that is if we had a tournament there, sometimes you need to get into the park earlier to set up. Right? I don't know that you know games are not going to start at 6 o'clock. Usually tournaments, I mean, when I used to play tennis tournaments, they started at 8. Um, but you need setup time, and then you need close down time. So if you have a tournament and people stop at 10 o'clock or whatever, um, you're still going to need time to shut it down and clean it up, so you don't want to necessarily have to vacate the park. 
But okay, can great. we do that? No. Can we do that through a special uh, a permit? I mean, like we do on the beach or anywhere downtown, you're allowed certain hours, and then if you want to extend those hours, yeah. you do it by special permit. Correct. Like when the events come to us, right? And there's a, a special. Yeah. I agree with the commissioner. I just think yeah. midnight is a little too excessive. Yeah. But Correct. I could see how maybe if there's a tournament, that might it, that might be a possibility, but not on an everyday occurrence. Correct. But if there's a you know, some sort of national tournament or something like that. But um, right. no, I understand. I, I think that this will be a, a really good addition to the park. Um, I, I do see this as public land for public purpose. I think this is a, an area of the park that has not been accessible to the public. Um, and I do believe that the design is really attractive. And I'm really also happy that you'll be adding to the, uh, to the greenery because uh, I think that right now that, that area of the park is lacking. So the more landscaping, the more trees, um, the better. Uh, and uh, I think this is a really good addition to, uh, to that part of the park. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Before I begin, I just one quick question. I'm looking at your latest design. You're going to have a restaurant, and then you're going to have a, um, like a little outdoor bar closer to the lake. Did you end up combining them into one facility? Well, Basically, when you what we what we have is the lake house, which is twenty seven hundred square feet. That is, it's the lake house. It's the one on the lake. And the restaurant's going to be at the lake house. Correct. Okay. Um, just so my colleagues know, um, to uh, help unburden some of the uh, frustration, we did have a meeting yesterday of my community. We spent like close to two hours. Uh, Phil Thornburg was there. Thank you very much for your support. Um, we had roughly um, almost like just under 100 people that, precipitate, that participated both online and in person. It was roughly half and half um, people that were against it were pretty vocal and people that were for it were just as, as passionate. Um, I've gotten a ton of emails, a ton of uh, text messages, phone calls. It seems that people are more concerned about pickleball than our water and, and sewer plants. So at what point, if, and, okay. Um, but you no, know, they were, had, a, a, a lot of valid arguments. A lot of the people that were against pickleball did not, not against pickleball, but against the project per se. Um, but the most useful thing was uh, specific things that people did and didn't like about the project, because we're not here to say whether or not we're going to have it, but um, the site plan and, and what the eventual project's going to look like. And I have, we've summarized a few of the things, uh, the, the comments that went through yesterday, and I'm just going to read through them briefly if you want to touch upon some of them. You've already mentioned that to our group, but as a community as a whole, if you just want to uh, go back uh, answering that again. The hours of operation, that was one of the first things that had come up. Um, lighting, uh, the lighting that's going to be on the park per se, traffic, uh, fourth, uh, whatnot, maybe installing a traffic light and things that might be needed for improvement. Parking was one of the issues, concerned about um, Big one was the dump site. Uh, Edgewood did not want it by Nova. That might be something that we could negotiate. Uh, nobody mentioned pricing about what it's going to cost or if there's going to be a, you know, a, you, know, you have to have a membership and whether or not the city will have, uh, will have discounts for the residents of the city. Um, noise concern after hours, drainage, as well as the seaweed issue. Those are a few of the things if you wanted to uh, now, we, you've already addressed them at our meeting yesterday, and I thank you very much, Ms. Bogdanoff, but if you want to just, uh, for sure. the general public. I think uh, some of the concerns we heard, and we took copious notes, so we have them, and we're going to incorporate them into the site plan. Um, it, it, I think there were some concerns that the comprehensive agreement didn't specify certain things that you know would normally be do, done through the CR, uh, DRC process, and that is that people would be coming in through Perimeter <coughs> Road for the ingress <coughs> egress to the property, and I think that obviously is something that's going to be through DRC. Uh, they, we have lighting issues in code. Um, obviously, we, we, we know what we're doing in Fort Lauderdale because we have the whole turtle issue on the beach, so um, we're going to be working with them to make sure that there's minimal light pollution that comes from the lights, but keep in mind, we are on top of 595 in the airport, so if you want to talk about light pollution, you know, we have to kind of address that as well. Um, I think there were um, some concerns about, there was no commitment. I think one person said, oh, there was a commitment uh, for the light. We have already talked with the county and have received a tremendous positive feedback that they want to work with us to see if a light on 4th and perimeter, because it's a dangerous road now, but with more traffic, it could be more dangerous uh, to put a light there. Um, but that is a county issue. That's not a city issue. 
Um, and I can go, you know, back through my notes, but obviously want to incorporate, and we're at the beginning of the DRC process. If, if we can get your blessing on whether or not you like the renderings and if you, you like the concept that we're trying to create, we move forward with DRC and we will continue to reach out. Like I said, this was our 11th public meeting and we will continue to reach out and get feedback. Um, I've talked to numerous residents who have suggestions for us. Um, as far as the fee structure is concerned, in the CA agreement, we specifically say that we're gonna sit down with the city manager and review it. Remember, we're going to be a, this is a 50 year partnership. We're not looking to be adversarial with the city. Uh, the gentlemen that are the principals of this project are, are residents. They're pickleball players. Um, they're going to be. They're going to be here. They're, you're going to. You know, I would say it's being a local elected official is is very difficult. I was a state elected official. Nobody knew who I was when I walked into Publix, but believe me, they know who you are, uh, and they're going to know who the principals are. So we are committed to running a a top notch facility um, and making sure that everybody can enjoy it. It will be an opportunity for a lot of families to come and sit on the beach. Um, you're not going to have to sit in a chair and order from a hotel, but you could sit on the beach on your own towel and you can have food and you can have drinks and you can play with your kids. Um, and there's just going to be a lot of activities where people are not going to have to spend money and come. Activating a park, I mean, Snyder's one of my favorite parks and actually my favorite park in the city. And um, personally, I'm excited about the opportunity um, to utilize it more. I mean, I've had birthday parties there. I've taught my kids to ride their bikes there. Um, but there's, if, unless you play disc golf, you know, or want to have a picnic, there's not a lot to do, or you have to have a dog. So um, we're, we're excited about it. One of my big concerns was public access uh, and um, what is and isn't going to be charged for. And if I'm not mistaken, um, the, the beach is going to be, the, the lake's going to be renovated. It's going to be rehabilitated. Uh, they'll be using of kayaks, beach, mm -hmm. chairs. Uh, um, I mean, there's a lot, most of those areas, there's no, the public has access to all of that. Is that correct? So 100% mm -hmm. of the facility is public access. And please, please keep in mind, the, the comprehensive agreement mm -hmm. merges the buildings mm -hmm. and the entire facility with the land. Mm -hmm. The city owns the land. We're not leasing the land. We have a license to run the facility, and we have certain benchmarks. And if MPI doesn't meet them, the city has every right to say we breached the contract and they can throw them out. Um, so yeah, and, they, and we put in there, just so you all know, a lot of uh, you know benefits for the city. The residents are going to get discounts. There's gonna be a minimum of 1,000 hours of free court time for the residents. Um, we are providing pickleball equipment to every school in the city of Fort Lauderdale, offering the coaches free le lessons, offering the city of Fort Lauderdale residents free lessons. We want people to come to this sport. So we're looking to do a lot. We have 1% of general revenue going into the city um, and or 100,000 minimum, and it's gonna be more than 100,000 um, hopefully. With the 1%. Originally, we wanted that money to go directly into Snyder Park to continue to make improvements. Um, the city attorney at the time told us that we couldn't really designate where the money went, so it's going to go into, we're hoping, an account that's designated parks um, so that perhaps maybe the city can, you know, help more people engage in the sport. Um, but there's a lot of benefits in there um, for, for, the, for the members. I was talking to uh, one gentleman who called me and said, well, can you kind of support the 55 Club? I guess there's a group of people. And I, so I said, well, tell me what the terms and conditions are because they have to go to the indoor courts, uh, I guess, in the summer months. But now we have covered courts. So there's uh, going to be other options for them. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Vice Mayor, I hear there's even talk of a tunnel to the courts. <laughs> Am I going to have to have those girls come back and spank I you? I don't think the water taxi goes there. <laughs> I just want to end the water taxi for Commissioner Herbst. You'll take the water taxi. Well, I'm, I'm concerned about the people all oiled up and sweaty on the beach there. Oh, though, they're going to be, sure I know. That's, I, that's, that's all that came to my mind when she talked about the beach was the vice mayor's sweaty, oily people and uh, schlepping their chairs and everything. It's okay. I guess it's they'll be okay. in the shade Thank structures. Um, but, but I do actually have a question about the beach because when I was out there today uh, and I was with park staff, we were talking about the water quality. And so one of the problems we have, because that's not a fed source, um, the water kind of gets stagnant in there. And the closer you are to shore, it may not actually be suitable for people to go off the beach and into the water. So what's your plan for, for uh, I know you're going to be testing the water quality, obviously. Um, 
but what's your plan going forward if that water is not suitable for use? Are we going to get rid of the beach? Are you going to post it as no swimming? Um, what's the, what's the, what's the, or are you going to somehow attempt to clean the water itself? Well, we obviously the, the goal would be to try to make the water quality to DOH standards for swimming, but if we can't do that, obviously there might be no swimming. But we do know that the city of Fort Lauderdale police currently use that lake uh, for training. Right, but they're they're going to the middle of the lake, which is cleaner than the shore. It's the shoreline itself where the bacteria tends to accumulate. So they've got some cars down there that they use to dive into. Right. So they're boating out there, dropping down. They're also in a wetsuit when they do that. Mm -hmm. So their exposure to you know biohazards is significantly less than right. it would be somebody wading in off the beach. So that's more my concern. We're we're um, responsible for maintaining the lake. Um, and we're going to do everything in our power to see. I know that they had difficulty before, but it could have been an issue of funding because everybody says it, it, it became an issue, but sometimes it's an issue of funding and not being able to keep up with the water quality of the lake. So that's one of the things we're going to be exploring through the DRC process, working with DOH. We've got um, a number of you know experts and professionals that are going to help guide us to see because the goal is to get it to swim quality. If we can't, it might be for kayaking quality, but what might not be for swimming. Right, and, and then my other question goes to the comments that were made about the hours of operation. So what are our regular hours of operation in that park? When are people permitted to be in that park other than the proposed facility? Phil's gonna assist with that, Commissioner. And thanks, Phil, for uh, walking out there with, uh, with me and Enrique today, appreciate it. Sure, you're welcome. So typically, we close at dusk. We did put hours on it. I think it's 6 o'clock in the wintertime and 7 o'clock during the summer when it stays a little lighter in the evening. But there's no lights. Most of the park is dark. So it's so, always been a... So then how is that compatible with staying open till midnight? So if I've got somebody going to the pickleball courts versus somebody just walking around the park, how do I differentiate? Somebody could say, I'm on my way to pickleball or I'm coming back yeah, from pickleball. As I understand That's an it, enforcement issue that I'd be concerned I understand about. that they're gonna have a, there'll be a barrier between their development and the rest of the park. So they'll, when we close the park in the evening, then we'll, that barrier will be closed as well. So the only way to get into the pickleball and out, and in and out would be from Perimeter Road. So we'll clear the park as we do today, close the front gate, and then only the, the park, the pickleball court would be open. At is, is there any kind of security contemplated for for that late night hour? So that's the other thing too. Obviously, you've got people in the park at, at midnight potentially. Right. Um, what's what's the what's the plan for security? We're, we're responsible for the security. That'll be all part of of, of the DRC process moving forward. Um, obviously, we want everybody to be safe. Um, so we're going to be monitoring, you know, obviously who, what's what's there. Um, we don't have a specific plan yet, but that will certainly be something that we share with the city to make sure that everybody is safe until the pickleball facility closes. Thank you. Commissioner Beasley Pittman. Okay, thank you. Um, a lot of my questions have been answered already, um, but I do have a question regarding the restaurant. Um, beverages, alcoholic, non-alcoholic, both. Uh, we are looking uh, for the same privilege that they have in Holiday Park. The Panthers are, will have a restaurant and liquor. You also have that at Lockhart. Um, and in the comprehensive agreement, we're asking the city to work with us to get a liquor license. Okay. Um, not completely familiar with that particular um, agreement. Um, if you are, um, if there is a competition, a, how long would that restaurant be open in regards to serving the alcohol if it goes through? When, if we were to do a, a large-scale tournament, um, we would probably, depending on what was the, going on there, we'd have to go through some sort of process. We're, we would work with the city. If mm -hmm. the tournament goes till, I don't know, 10 or 11 o'clock, the restaurant might remain open until then. Um, if, you know, we'll, this is, to me, this is kind of a negotiation with the city. If they mm -hmm. want us to, you know, shut down at 11 o'clock, we shut down at 11 o'clock. Um, but, you know, again, you're, you're at the beginning phases of this. We don't we know that there's a, a huge interest in bringing tournaments to Fort Lauderdale. Um, it's something that we have to work through. But you know, the, like again, the the 12 o'clock is really more for you know you gotta you gotta have time to tear things down and clean up and make sure that you know you can get people out. It's like anything when you stop serving at 10 o'clock, people don't necessarily leave the restaurant at 10. 
Someone's going to want a nice cold beer after yes. a, a hearty game. <laughs> that, that, that's a very good question, though, because I know when I go to football games, they cut off at, uh, at halftime. So you can't drink anymore after a certain point. It doesn't matter what hour of the day. At, at the midpoint of the game, they stop serving, right? Well, I think that's because of the spectators as opposed to the players. Um, players, you know, the spectators are cut off. Uh, because of rowdiness and, and getting home. Uh, without and the players eating. can drink all night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can drink all night. <laughs> I think it's a different crowd there. <laughs> all right, so uh, but thank I'm, you. I'm sorry if I could finish. I, oh, okay, I appreciate I'm sorry. the levity, but no, I'm just, I'm just curious. Um, Helen, so at what point would, if we wanted to put restrictions on that, what would be the appropriate time to incorporate that? If, if not, it, you know, when does the commission get to, from a policy perspective, say, um, I want to cut off alcohol at nine o'clock or whatever that may be. So what's, what's the appropriate time for us to consider I, that? The, um, the comprehensive agreement kind of outlined it, but to, to be perfectly frank, I, I think it's going to be more dictated by the insurance companies and from a risk management standpoint. Obviously, there's a lot at stake here for the owners and the people who invested the money in this. And, there, and one of the reasons that you cut off on spectators, it's a liability issue. It's a risk management issue. Um, there's nothing in the comp comprehensive agreement that would restrict us, but obviously we're looking to be good partners with the city, and if there's concerns, we will, we will consider those concerns. We will probably model it after maybe what the Panthers are gonna be doing in their restaurant. I don't know what that is, but we're at the very beginning stages. I honestly don't have an answer for you. And, and does the comprehensive agreement include alcohol? Yes. Okay, so, so that ship has sailed, okay. Yes. Okay, um, I'll reserve any questions I have till after public comment. Thank you, uh, and now we'll let the public speak. Um, we have quite a few people who have signed up to speak, and we've got maybe um, 45 minutes in which to get this done, so I would encourage you to try to limit your remarks to two minutes if possible. So I'm gonna call you three at a time so you know that you're about to um, speak so that you can stand behind the, the speaker and we don't uh, consume time by walking up. Start out with uh, Ted and Sarah. Ted, you front and center. Uh, Virginia Smith and Tom Tuberville. We ready? Yeah. yeah go ahead. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Ted and Sarah. In, in this, I, how you doing, Warren? I heard the word. Uh, no, we're not specific about this plan. We believe this is going to happen. This is our opinion. You know, that's that's not that's to me. That's just not good enough. Um, I'm sure you guys are tired of hearing about this all the time, and uh, you're probably tired of hearing from me, and uh, and that's not going to change. But uh, I remember there when there was once a croquet community, there was once a backgammon community. I mean, who's to say that this uh, now this new pickleball community? Um, I just. I just don't think that it's going to last that long. And a barrier, there's no barrier that I think can keep people out of anywhere. And then the first thing you're going to know, these people are going to be spending the night in the park. We're going to have a situation where the people go from the waterfront jail to the waterfront home in Snyder Park. And uh, it's, it's just too lush and too beautiful of a place to ruin. And th this is going to ruin. The reason why this part of the park is not open and, and not used, it's because the city closed it. It wasn't closed because of anything else. They closed it. And then they're wondering, look, there's nobody down here. And, and, and now they think that pickleball is going to save that end of the court. I mean, that end of the park, that's, that's just not also true. And, uh, you know, it's, this has been a fight. I think I've seen Ellen now more than I see my own family because we're at these meetings and stuff Sorry. all the time. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, th this, is, this is a beautiful place. You know, we can do other things to it besides paving it all over. That's all I got. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Virginia Smith, followed by uh, Tom Tuberville, followed by Ann Wiley. How are you doing? Thank you, City Commission. And it's, um, I'm sorry for my attire, but I've got a couple of days before I can do my laundry. My, name, my concern with the, uh, with the um, uh, Snyder Park is because it just seems like it's, well, first of all, it's the last green space standing. Huizinga Park, Wayne's, um, gifted property or how I don't know how that was managed but um, it's slated to be basically turned into a um, glorified dog walking park paved with a few benches and some shrubbery that I'm sure the um, the local population will enjoy 
So that screen space is gone. That permanently houses um, sports teams or hosts various sports teams and dog walkers and various small concert um, church, church groups, other local small groups. Okay, so we've got about another 100, 120 minutes, 20 seconds. So, and then the median slated to be slain. And also in the course of that having um, redeveloped um, that property, uh, the tree now, which is what, 30 years old, 9-11, <laughs> Honor tree has basically moved, and anyone who, with any sense that knows you can't move that 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 tree would not have survived the move in the first place when they authorized that. So now it's withering. So then we've got the median and the lovely mature trees. It sounds like a tree trivial, but it is not because really the only thing that makes Los Olas special are those mature trees and the canal. It is not the basically mostly junk clothing stores where you can find the same. Uh, polyester printed material flopping in a breeze at the swap shop. Okay, I, uh, these are not well made clothing. They're just stuck on mannequins, put in a high end neighborhood, and they're charging. And nobody's really on Los Olas for the, anybody with any season traveling. Now, somebody who's maybe stuck in a farm in, in Iowa doesn't get out much. It's, you know, it's, you know, but anybody really is not. The, the really thing, special thing about Los Olas are the trees and the architecture and the canals. So now we've got the last green space standing, and yeah, what are we gonna do? Where are you gonna picnic? You're trivializing Thank you, picnicking. Virginia. Most people cannot, okay? It's the only green space we've got left, okay? We can walk, talk, a picnic, um, play Frisbee, just relax, and it doesn't have to be produced, produce, produce, and must produce. People need space just to chill. Okay, thank you, Virginia. Purposeful. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you. Tom Tuberville, followed by Ann Wiley, followed by John Rodstrom, Jr., I assume. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, uh, Glassman, with Pittman, and Herbst. Um, I'm Tom Tuberville, Vice President of Edgewood, Edgewood Civic Association, but today I'm not speaking on behalf of the board. Mr. Mayor, may I? I have digital props, if I may. Um, I'll try to keep it within two what? minutes. You have what? Digital props. Or That's fine. You have a, hundred, a minute and 45 seconds. Got you. All right, I, regarding, uh, let's see, regarding uh, the presentation you just saw, I'm not, I have uh, discrepancies with the acreage that's being requested. So let me just um, pull this up if it will. And I also have, well, let me do this. Well, what is it that you wanted to, what? what well, the you... acreage that's being uh, cited in the comprehensive agreement does not match what um, what the site plan shows. So, in a nutshell, the MPI, the developer, is requesting 10 acres. Uh, comprehensive agreement shows eight acres. And they're also, I think, claiming, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's uh, Snyder Park is, is only, from what I can tell from desktop analysis, is 88 acres. So the 10 acres into 88, 88 acres is 11 and a half percent. So what we're proposing here is, is uh, public uh, public land going over to hand being handed over to a developer, and that's 11 percent of a of a of a public park. Um, so I'm on record saying I'm I'm against that. I'm against any public land going over to a developer. So these photos, uh, I'd like to supplement the photos that you saw in the previous presentation. 16 seconds. Uh, all of these photos you, you see are within 10 acres requested. All of these photos. And to quote Joe Pesci, those brown things with green things, those are called trees. All right. All right, I'm not. <laughs> we get, I think we understand your position. Disc, all right. Disc Thank golf you. holes four, Thanks. five, and six will be removed. But my main concern, here's the tournament. My main concern is, look at these photos here. This, this is within the 10 acres as well. This is the back of the yard truck parking. This is the seaweed site, seaweed site, and the transfer station. According to the comprehensive agreement, all of this is to be relocated. The relocation site and comprehensive agreement is directly in the middle of Edgewood. Now, I don't know if this is new to everyone here, but Edgewood is the shaded area here, all the way from I-95 to the FEC tracks from State Road 84 to the Perimeter Road. The transfer station, or I'm sorry, let me, I'll do the, I'm 
Nova site. That's the relocation area. See the, the in yellow, that puts it that much closer to the residents. And it's not just the operations, it's the, it's the traffic. It's the truck traffic. And from my understanding, police and um, parks and rec staff will, will have offices here. It's commuter traffic as well. I love the police patrolling the area, but if they're going back and forth to work, it's commuter traffic. And they're going to use the neighborhood. All of this is residential. Uh, 4th Ave, they're claiming 4th Ave can be used for all the sea beat operations and the truck and the, and the transfer station. I don't see it happening. They may be talking about this path here, but that's, that's Floyd Hall Stadium. And for reference, Floyd Hall Stadium is also 10 acres. That's that white shaded area there. So the combined, um, here's the... Phil, yeah. Phil, how many acres is... Um, what is our city's what is our city's position on the the size of Snyder Park? I asked you that question yesterday, and I think I got a different answer than what Mr. Tuberville is saying. So I looked it up last night when it came up, and on our website we're showing ninety point two acres for ninety point two acres. Yes, sir. And how many acres does this is this uh, project going to uh, consume or take up? Uh, I wasn't involved in that. I believe it was eight acres. Eight point nine acres. Uh, okay, out of ninety, out of ninety acres. Okay, um, okay. All right. Actually, Tom, your 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 time is up. My time's up. All right. I encourage you. These files are. I think you have access to it. So please, when you have okay. time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anne, followed yes. by John Rodstrom, followed by uh, uh, Kitty. Kitty. McDonald. I do have handouts. If you could hand those, thank you. Yes, Mayor Commissioners. In the 1970s, Sanibel Island began changing their lighting ordinances, understanding that less light and correct light is safer for people, wildlife, and the night sky. In 2000, they joined over 50 communities, preserves, and parks across the nation who are dark sky certified, providing their residents, visitors, wildlife, and ecosystems with a healthy nighttime environment, an awareness Fort Lauderdale barely even understands. Despite the massive unsafe and blinding light pollution that floods the streets and skies of Fort Lauderdale, I've worked a lot with sea turtles, there are still a few tiny healthy patches where the night remains intact and unpolluted. Snyder Park is one of them. Snyder Park, like humans, is diurnal. Most of the park closes at six and the dog park closes at seven. There are very few lights throughout the entire park, forest and meadows, Consequently, the park and preserve experiences an intact, undisturbed, and natural night sky environment. For this reason, and that it is an intact ecosystem, from the leaf litter to the top of the tree canopy, Snyder Park has become an isolated oasis for the life that needs it for their survival. We go there to play and relax. Native wildlife and birds go there to survive. Snyder Park is a major stopover point for migratory birds in the spring and fall, a crucial wintering grounds for winter resident birds, and a critical year-round habitat for birds such as screech owls, barred owls, and northern cardinals. In the 57 years since Snyder Park was entrusted to the city for its protection and preservation, the natural, area that once surrounded, the natural areas that once surrounded the park have been systematically slaughtered and paved making the tiny speck of Snyder Park even more critical for wildlife survival. Almost done. The massive construction of the commercial pickleball complex would introduce, no matter how shielded or how sheltered, massive light pollution into what is now a rare dark sky environment, causing unavoidable harm and mortality to wildlife. We are but just one species who needs this planet to survive. If we are to be conscious humans, we must not take every inch for ourselves. All right, thank you. John, uh, followed by Kitty McGowan, followed by Alan Scharf. Mayor, commissioners, my name is John Rothstrom and I oppose this project as I, um, as I do almost any project that utilizes public land for the benefit of private profit. If you aren't aware, this project is completely within the District 4 neighborhood of Edgewood. Yet my park initiative has not presented to Edgewood HOA despite continually referencing their 11 public meetings. Wait, wait, slow down, slow down. Slow down. I don't have a lot of time. It's okay, slow down. <laughs> I've heard a lot of folks talk about how this is already not a FedEx on. commercial. All right, all right. <laughs> and that there is nothing that can be done. I want to assure you that there's anything but the truth. Plenty of developments have been halted through the DRC process. 
Florida law is clear that an affected party has a heightened standard for participation in the development review process. Edgewood's private interests are directly affected to an extent that is different and greater than any effect on the population at large. Moreover, Edgewood is an official city-recognized civic association that falls within the 300-foot notice area detailed in the ULDR. This combination of things entitles Edgewood to request party status during the development review process should they choose to seek it. Party status allows them to submit their own documentation and to be informed upon all facts in which the commission acts. When I represented Villa Tuscany Homeowners Association, their party status was a tool we used to defeat the AHF development that was built to be built next to the Vista community. If you're a concerned member that lives in Edgewood, I would encourage you to talk to your, your HOA board and get a public general meeting vote as to whether or not you approve or disapprove this project and to whether or not you want to get party status. Next, uh, there are clear zoning process notice, zoning process and notice issues here. Next, this park was granted to the city under the condition that it, and I quote, shall be used for, not, shall not be used for commercial purposes, but shall forever be used as maintained as a public park, the natural growth and vegetation thereof being preserved. Ignoring the deed restriction and the intentions of Byron Snyder and his family discourages future individuals from deeding land to the city for park purposes. Clearly the city's word isn't worth the paper it's printed on. Lastly, I find it hard to believe that, a fine, that they would be able to find financing project like this. I don't really know of many banks or funds that would fund a project like this where you have a deed restriction like that. And I would encourage you commissioners to ask them where their financing is from and whether or not their financiers are aware of the deed restriction. With a phased development project like this, I have major concerns over whether or not their financing is enough to get them through and what would happen if it got pulled for whatever reason. Thank you so much. Have Thank you. Kitty McGowan, followed by Alan Scharf. Alan, are you here? Yep. And uh, and then Charlotte, did you want to speak also? You're, you sign up to speak. Kitty. Hi, Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, Vice Mayor. Um, Kitty McGowan, I am a resident of Edgewood. In fact, I live two blocks from where the new seaweed pile is gonna be my new neighbor. Um, so yes, this is a very personal issue for me, but I need to say I'm not anti-pickleball. I think pickleball is great, but this is not a couple of pickleball courts. Let's not confuse this with anything other than it's a tournament facility. So when it's supposed to be talking about public access, this is a tournament facility. This is meant to make money for the developers. This is not about, there's no plan, there's no specifics in the general agreement. They don't have to hit any specific numbers. Oh, well, we might be able to make the water quality good enough to paddleboard in, or we might be able to do that. It was always, we've been sold on swimming, access, they're restoring everything. There's no timeline on anything. The other thing is, is that we, as a city, allowed this park to become dilapidated. This is our fault. I mean, so now to come back years later and say, oh, well, the park, no one uses it. Well, because we didn't take care of it. We were not good stewards of this beautiful, precious place that we all have grown up in. I grew up there swimming in, those, in that beach when I was a kid. That could explain a lot, I guess. Um, <laughs> but uh, the fact that, uh, that we're talking about one pickleball court exceeds our, con our current sound ordinances. One. You multiply that by 44, and then you add the, the lake effect, and a six-foot burn with some shrubbery on the top is not going to change anything. Not to mention the traffic that's going to come through my neighborhood with no sidewalks, multiple schools, and very narrow roads. I have to say, I'm very, very sad. I would definitely look at reducing the scope, reducing the timeline, definitely managing the traffic and security, and not to mention that the taxpayers of Fort Lauderdale are paying for this. We're paying for it, and yet everybody who's planning to come is from out of our city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Phil, Phil, can, can, uh, can you answer a question for us? And, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but um, I do recall that the community passed a bond referendum of $200 million to be invested in, in our park system, either to rehabilitate existing park facilities or to acquire new parkland. Now, had, when the community was asked to create a list of priorities, was Snyder Park included in that list? So Snyder Park is on the list of the two, $200 million or six a little over six million dollars uh, dedicated to Snyder Park for in the parks bond. Six million out of the two hundred. Okay, correct. Is any of that money earmarked for this area of Snyder Park? So we haven't 
actually got to that point yet when we final, had finalized reaching out to the community and, and staff to talk about the final site plan with our AECOM. The preliminary discussion was we were looking at a nature center. There's $3 million for a nature center in, of the $6 million. So at the time, the thought was to either put the nature center on the north or the south side of the west lake that we're talking about. It was, right. it was never talked about, but if you look at the preliminary plans, I think it shows it on the north side of the lake, but there was discussion, again, that would go through the community input process and then a final decision on how that six million would be spent would then be, um, you know, that would be what we would do. So it is, it so my, my understanding is correct that as far as where this money was specifically dedicated, I, I, read, I read the backup uh, of, the bond, of the bond referendum and the, the basic summary is that most of the money was intended for rehabbing the, the bathrooms and some of the things you just described, um, and really none of it was intended for this particular area. And, uh, and tonight we're being asked to review a site plan that looks like it's going to rehabilitate this whole section, which otherwise would not have been a, a, a goal or a, a target of the city. Is that correct? That's correct. That, like I say, the, the, the area we're talking about, ma mainly with the, our, our operations section, we were not looking at to doing anything with the bond. Okay. The only thing that I think was in there may or may have been the train station that, that it's referenced um, and maybe doing a little bit work there. But other than that, there was no money towards that southwest corner. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, before he sits down, yeah, can I ahead. ask one question? Uh, um, Phil, um, there are other parks that do have lights, maybe for tennis or basketball or things such as that throughout the city, correct? Uh, typically, how late are they open until? What's the limit that you'll have them open until? So most of our parks are close at 9 o'clock. Okay. Um, we have a few, if they have an athletic facility and, and games may go a little later, but I would say 10 o'clock is usually the latest that we would have lights on in a, in a park at an athletic facility. But most all of our parks, unless it's a conservation area, are close at 9. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Alan? followed by Charlotte, followed by um, uh, Madeline Otero. Good afternoon. Hi, commissioners. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I'm Alan Sharp. I've lived in Edgewood for 50 years now. Uh, I also swam 50, in the lake. 50, five zero? Pardon me? Five zero? 50? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Lost my we should dedicate, a, yeah, I we should dedicate in an intersection in, in your name, I, I think. I went on the beach with my kids. We've had a lot of fun at Snyder Park. I am very passionate about pickleball, although Commissioner Sturman has told us not be, it's not, this was not the passion night. Yesterday was the passion. This is for details. Uh, one other detail, I'm on, the, I'm on the board of the Civic Association. Yeah, speak, speak into the mic, yeah. I'm also on the board of our civic association, like Tom Turbeville. We do still remain <laughs> friends. I grudgingly gave him a ride home last night. Uh, he, he was nice. He was nice in the car. So um, the, detail, the details um, that I have uh, regarding this project is, uh, first of all, um, I would like to get a better idea eventually of what the cost is for me to play. I live about a mile and a half away from the park. And, uh, and I play a lot of pickleball. So I want to be able to walk over there or take my bike over there and find that out. Um, I'm interested in the hours also, which are going to be discussed. Um, I would like to know about one thing. There, right now, there's a, a walk-in gate into the park on the west side for residents to walk in or, or walk a bicycle in. I want to know, is that going to remain there? If I do walk in through there, am I going to be able to get over to the where the recreational pickleball area is. Um, I want to know if there's going to be uh, bicycle parking in the, in the new area. Uh, I'd like to know if they're going to have cold water fountains with bottle fillers so we don't have to buy all our drinks in the restaurant. Um, I'm out of time. Traffic lights is the last thing. I just think on Perimeter Road, there's a couple of death traps there, and uh, especially on 4th Avenue and Perimeter. And if that is, I know that's not a city thing, it's a county or airport. I don't think it's fair that this group would have to pay for that traffic light if one goes there because it's already a big problem. All right, well, thank you. Charlotte Rostrum, followed by Madeline, followed by uh, Ada Lopez. 
Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I'd like to just personally say congratulations to Commissioner Beasley Pittman. I've already congratulated the other new ones, but welcome. It's a wonderful position that you hold, and uh, you have the, the keys to the kingdom here, and I'm sure you're gonna make great decisions. First of all, I wanna let you know I am not against pickleball, number one, and I think that needs to be stressed. But what I am against is a privatization of public space, which is, in a nutshell, what you've done. And I will tell you that I don't believe that you could do that based upon section of the charter, and I guess you'll get Dean Spence to let you know this too, the section of the charter that I believe it is section 8.21 that specifically tells you that the city shall not sell, transfer, or lease for more than one year any land zone park in accordance with the ULDR. Also, additionally, any land that zoned park as of November 10th, 2004, shall we require a unanimous vote of the entire city commission to remove that designation of park. You did not have a unanimous vote at the city commission at your last meeting. I believe May, uh, Commissioner McKenzie was a vote of no, and there were three yeses, and Ben Sorensen walked off the dais. So do, you did not have a unanimous vote in order to go ahead and change the designation of park to do anything that was commercial. My understanding, and when I served with, up with Mayor Noggle, this was a big issue when it came to Mills Pond and putting the fire station there. People from all over the neighborhoods came and complained about using city parks for building and structures and basically something commercial. But because it was something of health, safety, and welfare, and something that the city was doing, i.e., like the pickleball courts in Holiday Park, which I was very uh, supportive of, those are also run by the city. This is a private development that's going to be developing, profiting, and operating the Snyder Park. I think you really need to seriously think about the precedence you're going to be setting when you open something like this up to the public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and just real quick, just real quick, if you want to take a field trip, not necessarily to Las Vegas, I suggest you go to Snyder Park and take a field trip. Thank you. Yeah. Mayor, Mayor, I, 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 could we have uh, Attorney Spence address that section of the charter? I, I, I just want to make I believe he did in his opening remarks, but, I just but want if you to want reiterate. to repeat them, are we in, is, is this type of agreement in any way a violation of the city charter? Uh, this particular agreement is framed as a license agreement and is not subject to that section of the charter, which refers to uh, sales, transfer, and leases of the property. Okay. So when this pro if this project goes forward as, as proposed and uh, is not, isn't the city the owner of the project? That is correct, and there's a provision in there that also makes the city uh, owner of the improvements of the park site as well. Um, section 6.03 speaks to the merger of title of all the improvements. Okay, I, I, I thought that, I just wanted, it bears repeating, I guess. No, and I understand. And then all of the uses that are in this project are uh, allowed, permitted uses according to our um, charter and ULDR? The uses are consistent with the park use with regards to the ULDR. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Madeline? Yes, Madeline Otero. Followed by Ada. Is Ada here still? Yes. Oh, there you are. And Susan Peterson, are you still here? There you are. Okay. Hey, I just, since it's been brought up about uh, Club 55, and I'm sure people don't, not everybody knows about it, but if you're over 50, it's a wonderful program with the Parks and Recreation. However, there's no pickleball all of summer or winter or any day that there's a, for indoor pickleball, that there's a school day. So um, that's very limited. It's three courts in the gym at uh, Holiday Park. Um, I have multiple sclerosis, so I really enjoy going indoors, especially in the summer. The other place to go is Salvation Army. You pay $5 to play for the three or four hours, or you can pay $30 a month to play there. Um, and a lot of people, we do that in the summer. Um, I wanted to also um, bring up the hours issue that keeps coming up. I don't know, I worked in restaurants. I'm a nurse for 40 years. No restaurant's gonna stay open if there's no people there. If there's nobody there, you're not gonna make any money. So I don't see where the restaurant would be open. I mean, the tournaments are mentioned four to six times a year. 
of that swing, or maybe in the weekends there would be enough people there to substantiate a restaurant being open. I can't imagine that expense. Um, pickleball is not a fad. I keep hearing that. Um, it's a sport that takes people away from the TV and uh, sitting home and watching video games. I, I love to see families playing with the grandparents, the parents, the college kids, and I even saw a little six-year-old at uh, Benison Park where the mother was teaching how to play pickleball. It's a sport that the whole family can enjoy, and it's, it's very um, social, and it's very important physical activity and social as a nurse to prevent dementia for uh, the senior citizens. So I just wanna say it's, it's not gonna be a fad because the whole family can play and enjoy, and there's people at different levels play different levels, and you wanna get better. It's, it's an amazing sport. It's not like any other sport I've ever played. Um, and I, I also think that it's just a really good um, opportunity for the city, because you will be, have people coming here for the four times a year, they're spending money, and the, they'll be in the restaurants and the hotels, taking lifts, taking Ubers. It'll bring uh, our name. It's on televised every time there's a tournament. And people like to watch pickleball. My husband was watching pickleball last night on TV. People will not. If you don't play, you will, might want to watch it. It's a fast game, it's over quick, um, and it's got a lot of skill. You can be a beginner or you can be an uh, advanced player. And it, I hope everybody will watch some tournament play. It's amazing. And there's uh, a mother and daughter playing. The, I think their last names are, I forgot, Waters or something. Uh, she's a teenager, and I think she's in Delray or Palm Beach, and she plays with her mother, and they go all around and people follow them. And uh, it's just, it's a good sport. All right, well, There's also you. a schedule of indoor, just so you know, at the Galt Ocean Mile Community Center uh, throughout the year, but not always, but you can also play indoors there that's as well. One, yes, that's one court. I, right. I take the watercolor class. The Club gotcha. 55 has so many things. It, uh, if anyone here is over 50 and retired, you'll get a lot of value. It's $55 a year. All right, thank you. And Commissioner, stop trying to bring people to the beach. Don't you know we don't have the ability to get there yet? Ada Lopez. Hi, Ada. Hi, followed I'm by Ada Susan Lopez. Peterson. Followed by Michael Ray. Are you still here? Oh, yep. And then rounding it out, Brucey Cummings. Brucey, are you still here? Where is Brucey? I think she left. Okay. She'll be back. Okay. Please, oh. please proceed. Yes, um, I, I support the project. Um, I think the design looks beautiful as a Fort Lauderdale resident. I really look forward to be able to go to a place like that. Um, I, the only, the only um, addition I would make to the design, I, I'd like to see um, electric car chargers in the parking lot. I think that would be something that would be you know helpful there. And I agree with the refillable water bottles that Alan um, mentioned. And yes, the uh, part about the hours, I do see the concern about that. I mean, keeping open till midnight does sound a little excessive. But other than that, I definitely um, support the design and the project. And so All right, forth. great. Thank you. Susan, followed by Michael. Susan Peterson. I live in River Oaks, um, um, right off 9th Avenue. And I take my dogs to Snyder Park to the lake sometimes. And I've been to Scottish Festival and other festivals there. It's wonderful. But um, I am against this project because I think it's going to ruin Edgewood. Um, I often drive on Perimeter Road. And sometimes it's totally clogged and jammed up. They have the airport parking lot right around the corner. I think that could be problematic. but. The main thing is all the traffic through the park, the light pollution, and the effect on the wildlife. Um, so I really uh, agree with most of the people who have spoken in opposition, and um, especially the lady who talked about the light pollution and the wildlife. Um, I have a wildlife backyard with my neighbor, and there's lots of critters there. But the idea that the migrating birds are going to be subjected to the light pollution and uh, all the traffic is really a uh, sad thing for me. Also, I think to honor uh, Mr. Snyder's contribution to the city and the parks and the spirit of it, and maybe even the letter of the law is very important. I don't think the city should be giving away public land to commercial interests, especially because that was not the original intention of the park. And the idea that the re-landscaping of hard, 
hardscape and paved over with some palm trees and other things is going to improve the environment there is, um, I don't think that's a, a good idea either. And I'd like to comment um, to the new commissioners and the whole city staff. I've been coming here for quite a while. <clears throat> I'm so impressed with the professionalism of the new employees, and I just think the new commission is wonderful, too. Thank you. All right, thank you. Michael. Thank you. I think this is a great idea, but not at Snyder Park. Uh, it's been bandied about that this is just a trash heap, it's mulch, and now we're going to build a restaurant, and that'll be public use, a private restaurant from an unsolicited request. Well, guess what's there now? Mulch. And it's been inferred that mulch is not public use, but you go to the city's webpage, and you can read all about how wonderful mulch is and how it benefits the public. It's the best thing since sliced bread. So, yeah, this is a great idea. But you don't take public land and move out and then bring in something else because that's not helping the people. But it is a good idea. What I suggest is there's this park up where I live in District 1. It's a stadium. And we were promised to park there three years ago. But it never happened. It's just sitting there. And guess what? They've agreed to pay for it everything. You don't have to pay a penny. So they haven't been using it because three years ago, you shouldn't have let them do that. You, they've been using it for their parking and you haven't been able to benefit from it. So why not benefit from it now? Make everybody happy, save money. I know my neighborhood, I live in Palmer Loss. They'll be thrilled if they can just walk down the street to this. So why do we want to take land from public now with all these people with all these issues? when we have this great space there and this rich man who's agreed to pay for everything. Let's move it up to the pink stadium. And the last thing is, this is symptomatic. It's just one more example of taking the public's land and rights and giving it away against their will. And right now there's a group circulating an initiative petition to stop this. Maybe they need to circulate a petition to stop all public giveaways until you all realize who you work for. Yeah. Mayor, can I just add a comment to that? So yes, sir. You raise an interesting point, and I, I did talk to Ms. Bogdanoff yesterday, and I asked her about whether or not we could incorporate pickleball courts up at Lockhart, uh, because I think that would be a very compatible use with the soccer stadium and what we're planning with our community park up there. And as she related to me, they need to be able to have this facility up and running for their 2024 season for it to be economically viable. And at this point, we would have to start from scratch. And that's not realistic um, in, in that respect. But um, I, I do hope at some point we might be able to incorporate some pickleball courts into, into the Lockhart site because I think there's a lot more demand for pickleball than we're just seeing here. Um, certainly, uh, as has been discussed, We've gotten a tremendous number of emails, both for and against this project. And I don't think anybody's against pickleball, to your point. I think folks are just against pickleball at this particular location. So uh, I'm hoping at some point we can, uh, working with our parks department, utilize some portion of that site up there and include pickleball at the facility. Because I think it would be very popular. It would be a great destination for people. Mayor, okay. just a point of information. Um, City Manager, again, this is because I like people to have accurate information. Lockhart Park is public land, correct? Yes. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure people understand that. I, last few comments made it sound like it's not public land. And just go build that there because that those remarks were all about public land for public purpose. But Lockhart is city-owned public land, correct? Correct, it is. Thank you. Okay, uh, no one else has signed up to speak. You have not signed up to speak, and we're, we're, we're well, it, we kind of, we kind of need to end it right now because we've got a lot of other business right now. But I think the points of view, I think the points of view have been expressed both for and against. So, um, I have not had a chance to really speak on this. Um, first of all, Mr. City Manager, what, what are you looking for from the commission today? So today we uh, presented this, um, the the. The design aspects wanted to get feedback from yourself. I think um, the proposer here uh, heard a lot from the public and heard a lot from some of your comments. 
And um, what we look forward to is uh, bringing this back for full approval from the commission at, a, at the next meeting. And then uh, as outlined in the agreement, uh, then they can start the, uh, the DRC process. Okay. So, um, I'm, oops, I'm confused by that answer. Uh, so city manager, the comprehensive agreement says that this had to make a design stop at the city commission before it went to DRC. Correct? So I, I want to ask our, our city so attorney. I don't understand that, what you mean when you said final approval. This has already received our approval and we have a signed comprehensive agreement. So what kind of approval are we looking for? That's what you're here doing today. You're approving the design of the, the site plan as it's being presented today. Now, the exactly. comprehensive so, agreement requires this body to approve the design before it goes through the development review process. Right. So have we talked about the design? I mean, I, I don't understand why city manager said it's going to come back and for approval. I don't understand that. And to add on to that, what aspects of this could we potentially change? Could we, and I'm not this proposing this, but just hypothetically speaking, could we say no restaurant? Could we say 20 courts, not 40 courts? What is approving the site plan you, you have, encompass? Well, it's not approving the site plan. It's approving the design. design. And you have wide discretion. Okay, so it's just basically a general proposal to create a site plan based on these renderings and 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 these designs. Correct. And, that, and then now it's going to go to DRC for right. uh, for refinement. And does it come back to the city commission for approval, or does it not? No. I it depends on the development level of review. I'm not familiar with what yes. level of review this particular project is. I I would have. I don't to believe that this to... comes back to us. I believe that these are all permitted uses according to our ULDR, and I believe that our I purpose today is to just weigh in on the design. That's what we said in the comprehensive agreement. So we have to weigh in on the design and. That's really what we're charged with before it goes to DRC. And then DRC might come up with other things, obviously, because that's staff's job. But I'm just not concerned. I'm just not aware of why we are still kicking this down the road. Good afternoon, Anthony Fajardo. I, I just wanted to say that we did look at the requirements. We would, we will know when they officially submit to DRC, but there's nothing that we read that triggers it to go beyond DRC. So just to kind of explain that process to you. There are certain triggers in, for development in parks. This doesn't hit any of them that we can tell, but we'll know when they, when they officially submit. So the purpose of this exercise was to allow the public and the commission to weigh in on the site plan, but it will- Design, not site plan. Excuse me, I apologize, to, on the site plan. No, design. <laughs> <laughs> design of the site plan. If I figured, I, if I kept saying it, you'll believe in it. So. Uh, what is the, it? The design. Good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so to weigh in on the design, and uh, and and that's it. We're not taking. We don't vote here anyway. No. So uh, so now it just I, we've wait. We've now the commission, except for myself, which I keep getting interrupted on. But uh, except for uh, but for you know final comments, um, the commissioners have weighed in on it. The, the community has weighed in on it, and now it just proceeds through your process. Correct. I would have to defer to. Well, he doesn't. He, he doesn't seem to have an answer, and you don't seem to have an answer. So, no. you know, well, I mean, someone, someone so, needs that. So, the comprehensive agreement requires the approval of the body. So, usually, you take formal action. We've already done the, that, right? Pardon me. You, usually, you, you take formal action at an evening's meeting, right? So Which we've done. We, the comprehensive agreement has already you've approved, been approved. You've approved a. Correct, as an exhibit to the comprehensive agreement, you do have a preliminary design. Right. So you're, okay, I understand. So the approval of the comprehensive agreement was a preliminary approval of the design, and this, this uh, meeting is now a, a An opportunity of, for us to, to do review that. and comment on that. Yeah. I understand. And that's it. That's it. Yes, sir. It. it proceeds to the development review process. I, know, I can't. I, yeah. I can't. All right. So that's that's the status of this. That's the status of this proceeding. Correct. That we're just we're just weighing in on the design. I concur with Mr. Spence. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Commissioner Beasley Pittman. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, 
Are you, have you concluded your remarks? Yes, that's, I just wanted to bring clarity to that because I was not in agreement with I, what I was just hearing from staff. I, okay. I believe that we've done our work, that we've weighed in on the design, okay. and now this goes on to DRC. This does not have to come okay. back to us. All right. So moving forward, um, first of all, I, I, you know, like I said earlier, the city, um, pa the, the community passed a $200 million park, parks bond, and this community gave us um, a list of priorities which it felt were important to, this, to the community going forward in ter terms of improving our existing park facilities or, in, in addition, uh, buying new open space. Uh, the city has uh, worked aggressively, uh, working with the Parks, Recreation, and Beach Advisory Board to, um, to approve various projects. We have uh, purchased additional land in certain neighborhoods, and particularly Sailboat Bend, I believe it was. and. Um, and, uh, and going forward, I know that there's been a significant amount of interest in pickleball. Um, the pickleball courts were not part of that $200 million bond. Uh, if, the city, if, the, if the city were to move forward uh, and to you know, um, uh, try to build pickleball courts on its own dime, uh, I can tell you right now that it would take away from a significant number of other projects that this community has already decided were a priority to them. This, um, these individuals that have come before the, uh, before the commission um, have, are working with the city to provide an amenity to a community that is demanding it. And we feel we should meet that demand. And I think that this commission is acting responsibly in partnering with this organization in order to provide an, an amenity uh, to, to a community that continues to grow and continues to prosper and to continues that, uh, to try to achieve a level of enjoyment for, for families, for visitors, for community that I think that uh, Fort Lauderdale is becoming well known for. So I want to thank the folks that uh, you represent, Ms. Bogdanov. Uh, I want to thank our city staff for moving forward and trying to refine this uh, this proposal. And as long as you don't have nude pickleball, which I understand is a new thing right now, uh, I'm good with this project, and I think we should move forward. All right? We good? We're good. Thank you. Thank you. On to our next item. Uh, commission reports. Um, Commissioner uh, Herbst. I have nothing, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Beasley Pittman. Okay, on my commission report, I wanted to um, address some concerns first. Um, I'm asking if we could have a discussion about reincorporating um, an invocation during our commission meetings. I know at one point we did have um, the chaplains coming in and rendering a uh, invocation and being reminded whenever we walk into um, this chambers, we do have the, on our logo and our motto, in God we trust. So I would like to have um, a conversation of having that reincorporated to the city regular meetings agendas. Okay. So we, we I think we eliminated it during COVID. Yes. Right. And, um, um, <sighs> I don't know what the reason was for not reinstituting it. Um, I know well, that Mr. Lagerblum and I had a conversation about it, but uh, does anyone else have any thoughts about this? Mary, I, I do have a comment with regards to that. Um, we do have uh, the possibility of requests from other, I guess you would uh, label them as faith groups that are non traditions uh, that. Uh, we would have Speak to, we would to, have to equal commit. protection issues and uh, would have to be afforded the opportunity to have an invocation for for those faiths as well, um, in, including say, satanic uh, organizations and so forth who have expressed interest in the past. Okay, so we could have a discussion to have that more defined to see, um, to understand more clearly who and how that would work moving forward. Unfortunately, we can't discriminate based on just on religion. Understood. Yeah. So but just trying to get a scope of I know. what it looks like. Okay. I, I think going back in my recollection, we had in the past request from 
uh, some satanic groups to present, as well as um, Mr. Stevens, who was doing his Festivus for the Rest of Us uh, display up in Tallahassee, was interested in, uh, in, in leading some type of a uh, uh, discussion. So I, I think that was some of the um, some of the earlier uh, folks interested in in participating. So, uh, Mr. Spence, you're recommending that we not continue in that practice because of the fact that it might go sideways. Uh, Mr. Stevens has contacted my office already with regards to um, uh, uh, a not def well-defined uh, public display request. Um, so I do suspect that uh, we will be hearing from him if we reinstitute uh, the invocations. Um, second question, or our connected question, would that include a moment of silence? Is, would that be something we could that, do? That is, that is fine. That okay. works. So if we can consider that, if that would be less of a um, controversial. We can do a moment, a moment of silence because it does not uh, confer onto anybody one right over another. It's just a moment of silence. So we could do that. Remember, we used to do that in grade school. They had a prayer moment and then they had a moment of silence. I think they got rid of that too. I don't know. Were you in school at the same time I was? You're a lot older than I am, so I don't really remember exactly the same things you remember. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Love it. I love it. <laughs> Sorry, Mayor. All right, we can talk okay. about that. Okay. All right, so we can talk about that. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, also, in regards to our Charter Revision Board, yes, um, we do have it on our city um, calendar that they meet on the first Tuesday of each month. Um, it's time to have them reconvene. You know, we're very close to our next election um, cycle. And if we could move forward in getting that particular board, the re review charter revision um, reinstated so they can re reconvene. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I, I think I have a vacancy, so I'll have to figure out. Did you just reappoint? You just nominated somebody. Did yes, you know yeah. I did. Okay, so, um, so do we all have, uh, could you let us all know what, what the status of our appointees are? All right, and then so by by the next, there, I'm sorry, there are none right now. All right, and we it's get full. one. It's full. And we get one, right? Okay. We we could switch, right? You can switch. The one. three of us could switch if we want. Yeah, newly elected officials can either reappoint or put a new person in in the first six months. You can correct? pick whomever you want. Right. Yeah. Oh, the, yes, correct. So our ordinance provides that in the first six months of year of the newly elected officials uh, taking office, that you have to either reappoint the individuals that were nominated by your predecessor or provide an alternative nominee to take their place. And this goes for all of the boards. This is six months from the time elected or that we took our oath like a month later? That you take office. Okay. Okay. <laughs> continue yes um also I, I want to um know the status with our previous city attorney has he been um has that process been completed um does he still is he still coming into the building what is what is the situation what has our previous so he's on administrative leave mm -hmm. uh, this afternoon you have a resolution that terminates his in, his uh employment contract mm -hmm. um effective february 8th 16 or 18 okay. of, of this year, uh, which is 60 days from the time that he was placed on administrative leave in accordance with his contract. Um, he still has access to his uh, emails, uh, and he still has access to the building. Um, as when this resolution is passed, um, we will... Uh, remove access with the exception of the email. We'll keep that for the inception, remainder of the Exception to what? I'm sorry. Didn't you... The email? Emails. Okay. Yeah, we'll allow him to remain having ac access to his email for the remainder of his administrative leave. Um, and at that, at that time, it will be terminated. Okay. And I think that that works to the benefit of the city because 
people's a lot of people may not know that his office had been terminated and, mm -hmm. and that you know business that had been ongoing they'll still try to communicate with him and we need to know what those communications are so yeah, it's, this, it works to our benefit and he has he has an automatic reply that references yeah. the administrative leave and um referring uh email contacts to myself okay okay um i have just a couple more items right um ahead. even in regards to the city attorney's office um is there a list that identify all the outside counsel that is working on cases um, that are pending? We can provide you with that list. Okay. Um, and I'm scheduled to have an update with each of you to mm -hmm. kind of go over items. Um, and, we can, I can okay. provide that list at that time. Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, also, I would like to see in um, regards to our CRA, um, there's some um, language in the um, current, I guess, um, I don't want to say bylaws, but the current CRA document regarding minority minority um, participation, um, use of businesses would. Um, Why don't you bring that up in the CRA meeting? Okay. All right. We can do that. All right. Um, the last thing, this is this is lighter. <laughs> I'm officially inviting everyone here in the city to the 2023 King's Holiday Celebration. It actually kicks off today um, in Lincoln Park at 6.30 tonight. Those of you who may not be here or watching online, um, there is an activity at Lincoln Park. Um, it's called, um, it's entitled More Prayer, More Power. So it is an evening of prayer. On Wednesday the 11th, there is a birthday celebration in honor of Dr. King at the African American Research Library and Culture Center. On Thursday the 12th, January 12th, um, it's considered a day of service and all the local house, high schools in our city have been invited to be a part of it. On Friday, Destination Friday, back at the African American Research Library and that will be an opportunity to learn and see um, more about um, Dr. King and his legacy. Um, on the 14th, that Saturday, there is a teen summit. And then on Monday, the 16th, the holiday, um, I've been um, asked and honored with the, the title of Grand Marshal. I'm really excited to be a part of that. And our mayor is, is going to ride alongside me in the car on the parade. Um, the parade actually starts at 9.30 a.m. And it's going to begin at um, Fifth Avenue, and Six Trunk Boulevard, it can um, go west on Six Trunk to Northwest 15th Avenue. At 15th Avenue, it would travel into Carter Park, which we will have the multi multicultural festival. So everyone in the city is invited, and I'm so excited that we got the banner out front here uh -huh. so everyone can see it. But looking forward to seeing each and every one of you on Monday or so, or somewhere there between today and Monday the 16th. Great. I'm all done. Okay, very good. <laughs> Mayor, Mayor I'm sorry, could I, yeah, um, I want to um, just follow up on something related to um, what Commissioner Beasley Pittman said. I'd like us at some point to talk about the process for recruiting a new city attorney. And I'd like to just put out there that we had a very robust one after Mr. Stewart left. Uh, where we set up a committee of, of um, individuals from the legal community in Fort Lauderdale that was used to evaluate uh, potential new city attorneys. So at some point, I'd just like to have that conversation about how we're going to move forward. And I want to just, again, raise uh, what I thought was a, uh, a very effective process and suggest that we consider utilizing that um, going forward. Thank you. Okay, I was going to bring it up tonight at the uh, on the agenda because we uh, once we once we conclude with those matters in tonight's agenda, we do need to move forward. So, my recommendation was going to be that we bring it up at a conference meeting and we come up with a with criteria uh, at at a uh, at conference so that uh, we have that as a discussion item and then uh, we can move forward on that. Does that make sense? I think it's a great idea. Thank you. I just wanted to know yeah. when we're going to have that conversation, so I appreciate it, Mayor. Okay, Commissioner Glassman. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, let's see. Over the holiday, well, actually, the last Civic Association holiday party at Flagler Village on December 21, it was really nice. 
Um, I wanted to say congratulations to Broward Health on its 85th anniversary. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that was actually the first hospital to open in Broward County. Um, and the first patient was admitted uh, on January 2nd, 1938. So that's amazing. Um, now the 10th largest public health care system in the nation. Uh, so happy anniversary. And the first and the first person to be born there was at the event. Do you remember? Dr. At the Sturman. event. Yeah, yes. yes, that's true. Right. And I believe that Vice Mayor Strimmon, weren't you on staff in 1938 when it first opened? That was an A ticketed. That was a B ticketed. Oh, okay. I, I thought so. Um, anyway, happy anniversary. That's a great, a great milestone for Broward Health in our community. Um, Commissioner Beasley Pittman has already discussed all of the Martin Luther King events, um, and that's typically a wonderful time of year for our city every single year. Um, Wednesday, January 18th, Flagler Village, Civic, Flagler Village Civic Association has another meeting. And also on Thursday, January 19th, I'll be attending a Smart Growth Partnership annual forum and luncheon dealing with um, the impact that public art has on communities. So I'm looking forward to that. Wednesday, January 25th, I'll be convening a District 2 President's Roundtable where all of the neighborhood presidents come and we network and we, we learn from each other and it's always a, a, a wonderful get together. Um, Thursday, January 26th, I'm looking forward to our commission goal setting workshop um, at the YMCA. Also that day, we have Hyzinga Park's 20th anniversary celebration that evening. Uh, also that evening, the opening reception for the Avenue of the Arts uh, Visual Art Festival. Um, Friday, January 27th, I'll be attending the International Swimming Hall of Fame board meeting. Um, and then Saturday, January 28th, we're going to have a very exciting day at the Aquatics Complex uh, for the Aquatic Center ribbon cutting and also an amazing dive show ex exhibition, um, the Aishaf Dive Talent Challenge, and that's on Saturday, January 28th. Um, that's it for me. City Manager, are we going to discuss St. Patrick's Day at all, or are we going to wait for that when it comes before us? Because there's a lot of talk around um, the beach area about the move to try and move that from downtown to the beach, and we have some concerns about that. The staff's working with the event coordinator, and so we want to bring you full details before. Uh, we want to firm up our, our full details before we bring that information over to you all. Okay, excellent. And then just one more thing about... Um, events such as that. Uh, so city manager, I've talked about this a lot, but we're still not getting a full full picture of uh, master calendar of events, especially as it relates to the beach. Um, if we could just work on something where people could go to one site, see what's proposed, see what's approved, see what's coming, um, you know, a really nice master calendar. Um, people are still having difficulty. I know that we've always talked about um, you know, how people are getting around, what's happening with transportation, um, you know, police presence on the beach for guiding people on and off the barrier island. There, there are still so many concerns that don't seem to go away. Um, so if maybe we can just work on getting a better handle on all of that, um, because again, um, those events are increasing uh, and so many more people are making the barrier island a destination for a variety of reasons. Um, but again, people just don't feel comfortable knowing that there's just a one-stop place where they can get all of this information uh, for all of the events. We will work on that. Okay, thank you. That's it for me, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, Vice Mayor. Uh, again, the problem going last is everything's been discussed already. Um, I do agree a couple of things. Um, charter review, I believe, like you mentioned, um, beginning of February is when the first meeting is, is slated to go, and I think you're going to be asking our... Um, our goals at our next uh, January 24th meeting. So I um, uh, just want to make sure that charter reviews up uh, and slated to start. Uh, we, number can't, we can't convene that that board until we have approved the uh, appointments. Right. So I think January 24th is when we approve the appointments, and which means that in February the board is free to start meeting. Well, at that okay. So try to get your nominations in before then. Right. right. That's right. that's my goal. Right. Exactly. Um, number two, uh, we already discussed this uh, process of getting a new city attorney, uh, and um, I, I'm glad that we take, got that taken care of. Um, a thing that was brought up in my um, uh, in my community is I'd like to get uh, what's the status of the tree ordinance? I think that we were working on that, and that's sort of been sidetracked. How are we doing? Uh, is that so something that we could? I'm going to ask uh, Chris Cooper to come up and provide the latest status.
Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Chris Cooper, Director, Development Services Department. So we met with the Planning and Zoning Board, I believe, in December and gave them an update presentation in anticipation that we're going to bring that back to them in February for consideration. Okay, whatever we could do to move that along. Okay, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, uh, another thing is um, Mr. City Manager was talking about a, uh, um, a safer grant to add at fire, fire rescue. You want to bring us an update on that certainly we can uh, bring an update at a very future meeting I know that the safer grant according to um, Chief Golan he's looking into that already uh, one of his first uh, projects is to see how we can secure that and start applying so we will bring that in February I want to welcome the new uh, fire chief thank you very much for stepping up to the plate and last thing um, I want to talk about one of the problems in my community um, is the perception that a lot of the P3 things were done behind closed doors. And I know there's uh, rules about how the P3 process goes through, but I know Dade County has a P3 ordinance, and I'd like us to uh, um, you know, do something about... Uh, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean behind closed doors? What, well, like, the way the process what are you referring goes... To? Who's, who's telling you this? What is that? I don't I mean, understand. I mean, it's... We, we, we were, were we considering a, P, a P3 ordinance or how, how are we going to manage the P3s come in the future or Dade County has something to that. If, if we, if we get an unsolicited proposal, okay, what? The, if we get an unsolicited proposal yeah. from a, from a, from a, an, uh, a proponent, the, it comes before the commission and then the commission makes the decision whether or not it wants to go forward with it. If it decides to go forward with it, there is a public review of the of the uh, application mm -hmm. for a certain number of days, and it's during that time in which the uh, the public has an opportunity to meet with the applicant, to talk with their commissioner, or to talk with any member of the staff to find out what is going on. Mm -hmm. There is not one thing. There's no smoke filled rooms in some back backdoor dealing that has taken place at all on any of these unsolicited proposals. So whoever's telling you that is misinforming you, Vice Mayor. And I and I actually I resent the, the suggestion that this commission has not been above board on everything that it has done to improve the uh, the the uh, the quality of life here in Fort Lauderdale. So that, please don't say that. No no yeah. I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I'm just saying um, uh, just is there a way that like, what did Dade County do with their P3 ordinance? Are you I don't that? know what Dade County does, but we all follow the same state statute when it comes to unsolicited proposals. It's a state statute. It's not by county. Mm -hmm. And the city has adopted that approach on numerous occasions, and we've benefited significantly in, in getting uh, the completion of our aquatic center to getting the, the, uh, the ice skating rinks and getting the soccer stadium. The list goes on, and I think there's almost a dozen projects that we've we've participated in, and which this community has benefited from. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know who, uh, if if you have something specific, or if a, if a constituent has something specific they would like to ask about. My door is open. I'd be very happy to go over anything that they feel has been be, quote behind closed doors. I just don't think that's really an accurate representation. I'll, of how we I'll do yield things. to, to uh, my colleague at the end. John. Mayor, could I, could I answer that? Because I, I think part of the problem is you may recall that state law on this has changed. So up until recently, all the P3s were, in fact, confidential and couldn't be disclosed. So I think, I think that's part of the problem is that up until just recently, um, we weren't allowed to disclose details of the P3 proposals because they were, they were confidential and exempt. So that has changed. There's, there's an opportunity to discuss them a little bit more now. But I actually want to be very supportive of that. In fact, it's funny you mentioned that, uh, Commissioner Sturman, because just about an hour or so ago, I sent an email to Greg and to Dee Wayne requesting that we do the exact same thing. Um, when we instituted our P3 ordinance, it's bare minimum that complies with state statute. And you're right, the one that we have down in Miami is a much more robust set of guidelines about how we move forward and evaluate P3s and, and approve them. And I had long talked with previous city manager when I was a city auditor uh, about beefing up ours, even going back to when Mr. Feldman was here. So with Lee Feldman, we had the conversation. With Chris Lagerbloom, we had the conversation. And, and I think that the public and the city, mm -hmm. and as well as the developer communities, would all benefit from having a better structure in place than the one that we put in. Because the one we put in, candidly, was, was hastily done 
And the reason I say that, and I was here when it happened, was because we got our first unsolicited P3 and we rejected it, but we realized that we needed to have a framework in place and we didn't have time to really explore how we were going to do that. So we just modeled it after the state's minimum requirements. And I think there's an opportunity to decide as a group if we think that that's sufficient or if we think that more protections in place for the community is a good idea. No, thank you. In summary, just revisit how we handle three P3s. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, no, that, that's it. Thank you. Okay. So um, I know we have a lot of work ahead of us, so I'm not going to go into everything, but uh, um, uh, I want to thank the uh, city staff for uh, all the work that they did to um, help facilitate a very robust holiday season. There's a significant number of events that took place in our city and uh, everywhere from Winterfest to Kwanzaa. And I, I just want to thank uh, uh, everyone who was involved. Uh, Debbie, wherever you are, I hope you're listening. You're an unbelievable angel to our city, and thank you for everything that you do. George Huska, again, all the wonderful things that you folks do for our city. Again and again, thank you, thank you. Um, we had a great turnout for the anchor drop on New Year's Eve, and uh, um, and honestly, uh, Mr. City Manager, I'd love to see us um, partner with the folks at the uh, the Drive Pink Stadium and see if we could get you know some really top drawer named acts and maybe move the whole event over to the stadium and make it a really uh, exciting event. I know in other cities they uh, they attract um, uh, performers that. Uh, become nationally televised events. I know it happened this past uh, year in Miami. Uh, you know, it would be great to raise the bar on what we do for New Year's Eve, and, and I think uh, we should continue that, uh, that conversation, seeing, seeing if we can get any buy-in from the uh, Auto Nation or from, uh, or from the Inter-Miami folks. Um, uh, looking forward to the Martin Luther King Day Parade, because uh, as uh, Commissioner Beasley Pittman said, we'll be sharing the uh, Grand Marshal Post that, uh, at that event. Uh, but the Friday before, there'll be an MLK Inspirational Breakfast at the First Baptist Church across the street at 7.30 a.m. So I invite everybody to uh, come and participate in that. Um, and then uh, on the 17th, I will be... Um, at 7.30 in the morning again, I'll be at the uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale uh, Forum that's uh, at Broward College, and um, uh, and I'll be having a conversation with Lamar Fisher, who's the county mayor on uh, city-county relations. Looking forward to a uh, exciting discussion there. Um, everything else, I think, has been discussed, so uh, uh, if there's nothing else, we can conclude the conference meeting and go into the CRA meeting. If something else, Mr. City Manager. Two things quick, just wanted to let you know that uh, upon inquiry from Commissioner Glassman, there's a new statute that presents the opportunity to provide the updates uh, of notices to the public and that we currently spend about $52,000 per year on average on advertisements. Uh, we're working with the city attorney on finding out how we can make that or enable the ability to post our public notices on the web instead of on a public circulated newspaper. Um, the other thing, too, about the Charter Revision Board, um, for next conference meeting, we're going to put an item for you all to discuss what goals you all would like to pursue with the Charter Revision Board. This also gives an opportunity for you all to make sure you have your designees appointed in the evening meeting. And um, the uh, Charter Revision Board meets the first Thursday of each month at 5.30 p.m. So certainly in February, there would be plenty of time for appointments to be done, goals to be set, and then also give direction to the revision board uh, for goals to pursue. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Um, Mr. City Attorney, do you have any uh, report? No, sir. Um, at the end of the meeting tomorrow, we'll be um, requesting a closed door at the next meeting. But just is there a closed that. door for this meeting? There is a. Oh, no, there's not a closed door for this meeting. Not not a litigation closed door. Okay, but is it contract nego contract contract for negotiation? Okay, case. all right. Um, when is that? I'm sorry, Mayor. When was that? Say it again. When was when is that going to be? The the uh, closed door. The the collective bargaining meeting. T tonight today, right? It is today. Yeah. Oh, tonight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, conference meeting is now concluded. Let's now begin the CRA meeting. Uh, Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Herbst. 
Commissioner Glassman? Here. Commissioner Beasley Pittman? Here. Vice Chair Sturman? Here. Chair Gentiles? Here. Uh, we have a couple people signed up to speak. Um, M1, motion approving minutes on December 20th, 2022, Community Redevelopment Agency Board meeting. Someone move the item? Do I hear second. A second? Move and seconded. Please call the roll. Commissioner Glassman? Yes. Commissioner Beasley Pittman? Yes. Vice Chair Sturman? Yes. Commissioner Herbst? Yes. Chair Gentiles? Yes. And uh, that motion is now approved. We have uh, R1. This is a resolution increasing the development incentive program funding in the amount of $1 million to Thrive Development Group for the Thrive Progresso Project and authorizing the executive director to execute any and all related instruments and delegating authority to the executive director to take certain actions. We have two people who signed up to speak. Um, does staff have any presentation to make? If not, uh, Beverly Chambers and Sefton Chamberg. Is Beverly here? I'll give you a couple minutes. Is Sefton here? No. It's been a long day. Woo. It's not over yet, dear. Yeah. <laughs> not for you guys. Hang around. Good day, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Beverly Chambers. I'm here on the behalf of the HOAs. Um, I just asked, my husband was going to speak just for brevity. We've had a few of the people that were here, but they had to leave because we thought it was going to be 2.30. So I started saying... As it relates to the agenda item R12003, we, the representatives of the following homeowners associations and civic associations of Historic Dorsey yes, River Bend. Can you, can you close, um, speak closer to the mic? Yeah. I always have a problem. You're, you're representing here Historic R Dorsey River Bend? I'm sorry? Did you, say, did you say Dorsey River Bend? Yes. Okay. Home Beautiful, Miss Tara Chadwick, Sweeting is the State, Miss Jackie Tuff, Durs, Miss Gwendolyn Haynes. All are in agreement that a hold be put on this vote and that a hold be put on any and all fund, future funds from the Northwest Progressive Fla Flagler Heights CRA. We are asking this commission for help. We are asking this commission to adopt policy related to minority businesses consistent with the recommendation from the 2020 disparity report, particularly page 164 through 167 to address the need for minority participation. At the CR advisory board meeting last month, and it is a part of your attachment as well, um, there was lengthy discussion as to how policies should be implemented to ensure the opportunity for minority businesses, particularly trades construction and construction, when developers receive funding for their projects. We have been told that a recommendation from the CRA and the CRA advisory board to the city commissioners would be the way to implement policy. Please refer to exhibit six more particularly page four of five in the fourth paragraph. Developers have come to the CRA and the CRA advisory board to approve for initial funds and quite often a second round of funding because of higher construction costs and the fact that their profit margins are decreased. We have noticed that evidence does not typically accompany, accompany these claims, just their word. This is not the case with R123003. Please note this is not a loan. We have asked the CRA and the CRA Advisory Board on many occasions for policy that would allow our minority businesses to participate. We have also petitioned this commission and was instructed by Mayor Trentalis in uh, previous months to meet with Mr. Woods, who is the director of the CRA, for explanation. We did. There is no policy in place. Millions of dollars are supplied to developers without regard to minority participation, other than the community benefits agreement that stipulates give back to the community and best efforts is a language that guarantees nothing relating to employment of community minority subcontractors. We would like the CRA to respond and if they would give their recommendation as well. Um, many of the developers put language in their proposal and agreements to the CRA that they will consider using minority subcontractors, businesses in the development, but unfortunately, more frequently than not, this does not happen. Therefore, we need policy by this commission that will assure our community of minority participation. We have learned that there is a remaining amount of $6 million in the CRA, 
Once the word gets out, you can be rest assured that the second round of funding for many of the developers who ever receive funds will resurface without minority participation. To conclude, pardon me, <clears throat> the community through the HOAs are respectfully asking the city commissioners to, po to postpone vote R123003 and stop the distribution of the remaining six million in the CRA until policy is implemented to also allow the meeting with the HOAs and the CRA director set for January 19, 2023 to occur for direct community input. Of course, within the boundaries of what the CRA can legally do for our community to also trace all community benefit agreements to confirm compliance and the significance of non-compliance. In other words, if developers com committed to community participation did not keep their commitment, what is the recourse? Perhaps return some of the funds given to them. Um, lastly, <clears throat> the initial development agreement for the Development Incentive Program from Thrive provides community benefit of 17 cents per square foot. The uh, new proposal has it stipulated at 18 cents. Our goal is simple. We are loving our community, respectfully. Beverly Chambers and the community. All right, great, thank Beverly. Anyone else wish to speak on this item? Can the applicant come up to the podium for a second? Is your attorney here? Just yourself. Can you come up to the podium? Let me just ask you a couple questions. Hi, sorry, I thought you were calling uh, Clarence. No, no, uh, introduce yourself. Uh, Jonathan Fish, uh, one of the owners of Thrive Development. So Jonathan, thank you for coming this evening. Yes. Um, tell us, uh, there seems to be a concern, a, a, and a rightful concern, that perhaps um, minority contractors are not participating in the, um, in the hiring and the development of projects for which CRA money is being utilized to supplement uh, the developments in, this, in the Northwest CRA. Could you tell us what your experience has been in this regard? Um, I, I mean, we pretty much had a project manager who submitted bids out to, I mean, we sent out our, our uh, construction documents and then whoever bid and we got a good price and we felt it was a good company, licensed and insured, we, we moved forward with them. It was nothing very specific. We're just kind of focused on getting the job done, you know, with the best budget possible as fast as possible. So have you ever received bids from minority contractors to your knowledge? Uh, not, not to, I mean, we have a lot of minority contractors or people working, um, nothing specific to my knowledge. So you have individual workers working but not specifically the companies owned by minority. I, I, yeah, no, no, I'm thinking of course my electricians a minority uh, um, con, uh, con, uh, owner. Yeah, there's, I'm sure a lot. Yeah. All right. I, I, I don't mean to you know corner you like this because it's a question that you aren't here to pre prepared for, to answer. But um, at some point, if you could just let us know a little bit more about what your what your experience has been uh, in terms of your record of hiring uh, people from the minority community, that would be helpful for us to determine how we need to go forward, you know, in terms of recrafting the ordinance if, if necessary, in order to ensure that minority contractors are involved in the, the expenditures of these of these monies. Yeah, I'll, I'll check into that. I remember now our stucco guy is a minority and painter and a framer, a lot, yeah. So you have people that are... Yeah, yeah, a lot. A lot. I just didn't even think of this. I mean, we, it was never something that we discussed. And I do remember at the CRA, they mentioned, I mean, you know, we're trying to get the project done, but it's it's nothing specific, but just, it turns out we do have a lot of minority con uh, contractors, yeah. Okay, if all right. Do you have any questions? Yes. Um, yes, not, um, my question is in my statement, it's not just only to this particular project. We want you to understand this. Um, it's been, it has appeared that there has been a lack of um, opportunity for minorities with the projects that have gone forward. So it's, it's timing. So the question is I have to our city manager, if I could get um, those documentations um, of 
the individuals who have been used for Thrive and any of the other projects that are directly affecting District 3. Um, it's my understanding, as it was said by Ms. Chambers, within that agreement, it, is, it, sh it says that there should be an effort or um, consider um, we moving forward before everything sunsets, if we can have that discussion about changing that language because it shouldn't be a option. It should be a part of what's required. Is Clarence here tonight? Yes. Where's Clarence? Right there. Hey, Clarence. Can you come up here, Clarence? And, and Mayor, too, while we're waiting for Clarence to come up, I think this is actually a question for the attorney's office because I know in the past when we've drafted a lot of these agreements, we've always incorporated best efforts language, and, and the attorneys will have to weigh in on this, but can we mandate that they hire a certain percentage of minority contractors? Um, do we have that ability? Is that, you know, is that discriminatory if we try and, and put something like that into our agreements? I I've, I've just would welcome your kind of feedback on that. So the specifics of, of set-asides are, um, there, there's a way of, of, of creating minority participation programs that will not run awry of the law, is, is what I would say. Um, and I can explore those avenues for you. Because we've done this in the past, in, in, when I worked for the city of Jacksonville, we had a minority business um, office. Mm -hmm. And we were challenged and lost. And so what we had to do was reposition that and made it a small business opportunity that, that's activity correct. as opposed to minority activity. So I didn't think we could simply create a minority set aside, but we can create a small business set aside, right? Correct. Uh, so similar to uh, what Barrow County has in place with regards to their procurement system. But to your point, though, um, can we, we can't require... Like, can we say you must hire 25% of minority workers in order for you to qualify for the CRA? I, th I thought that was against the law. We can't do specific set-asides, but we can formulate a program to encourage participation. Okay. But I thought we already had that language. In I already there. thought we did, too. We don't? Well, let's hear from Clarence. Hi, Clarence. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor members of uh, the board and <clears throat> so what do we do what how what's the what are the guidelines within the CRA as far as uh, hiring minority individuals so uh, this is uh, this situation isn't a, a simple one uh, if we're going to talk specifically about thrive right um, in every development agreement that uh, the CRA undertakes there is always there's always uh, um, language that uh, speaks specifically to community benefits. It's in the statute. It's in, it's in uh, uh, the um, <clears throat> redevelopment statute that everything, if we're going to convey land or whatever, we, there has to be a community benefit. So we, in all of our agreements, have as a part of uh, their requirements uh, some sort of community benefit. The community benefit f uh, of uh, Thrive is a reduced rent, a reduced amount for the rent that Ms. Chambers spoke of. She, she mentioned the 17%, that is actually 18%. But I think the actual uh, rate in that uh, um, project is 25 $25 per square foot. They have to provide 25% of the, I'm sorry, 25% of the, the $18 and 18, at 18, right. 25% of the total square footage, which is 60,000 square foot, it's a 60,000 square foot project. So 15,000 square foot has to be uh, given to, and the way, we, the way we do it is we say local businesses, local small businesses within the redevelopment area which captures that specific group. Local small businesses within the redevelopment area. We do have language in there that also speaks to uh, the hiring of uh, uh, local um, labor, but it does address best efforts language. Um, and 
part of the reason, you know, we, we do best efforts is because, I mean, it's been tried and true where we, uh, we require them to hire from the neighborhood and uh, we, as well as the, the contractors, and I'm not talking about them specifically, this is, this is just what has gone on, you know, forever. We try and recruit from the neighborhood. And we do, we are uh, somewhat successful at getting folks from the neighborhood to uh, get on, on, on our projects, but it's not always as successful as, as we would like to see. It's, it's, it's not as uh, in terms of, robust. In terms of their availability? As, as terms of the availability, you're talking about having a, a, a pool of persons right. that have the skills or whatever. Right. Obviously, construction jobs are easy. That's that's easy because it doesn't take a whole lot of skill, uh, and you, and again, remember, all we can require is from the redevelopment area, is from the redevelopment area. So, not only do we require or we have in their best efforts language for labor, but for um, um, hiring businesses and companies to actually do the work as well. But what we've what we found is is that even in trying to recruit or go out and find some more businesses, I mean, there's not a large pool of uh, these businesses. So what we've done in a lot of our agreements, uh, speaking specifically like uh, about uh, like the Adderley, the, the project that we gave $12 million, we allowed the developer to give us best effort language, but what we decided to do was take a portion of that money that we're giving to them, $12 million, and say to them, you're gonna give back a portion of that money, they, they're giving back 3.6, so that we can do training and, and uh, provide other programs to get our people working. So we don't just depend on the developer or those who are you know, doing the projects, we're doing it ourselves because best effort language always falls short. And short of mandating them, if you mandate them to do it, now you have to have uh, monitoring and compliance and uh, you have to set up uh, penalties and all of that. And then you're fighting over how much, how much is uh, 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 the right amount for penalties and they're gonna wanna settle on something that's, you know, acceptable so guess what they do they'll be willing to pay the penalty if they can't find uh well, the contract do you, uh, okay so do you feel that the folks with thrive have made a a, a good faith effort to hire f from the community when i go out there i see minorities out there on 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 their job but what we were looking for was to get that reduced rent for my and they they have a number of uh small businesses that are signed up that were recommended by the CRA to go into that project. So in addition to hiring, they're also offering reduced rent for reduced community rent based businesses. Businesses that will go into Thrive. Up to 25% of the square footage? Yes. Okay. Um, it's not a simple, it's, it's not simple. And I've been dealing with this for a long time and tried everything to, to you know, Mr. Try Woods. to get minority participation. Mr. Woods, um, hearing everything that has not worked mm -hmm. in your position, what do you suggest works to make this happen? What I just said was that if we're, if we're giving them money, we require them, we ask them to, to provide uh, 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 jobs and contracting opportunities we can't make them do it because of the law, but what we do is we take a portion of that money. Most of the agreements you see, they have to give, where we're giving money, they have to give money back, and what we're doing is we're providing that money to Broward College over at the Y mm -hmm. to do free training where they're getting um, uh, licenses, they're getting uh, uh, two-year degrees, and even some degrees. So we're, we're, we're providing an opportunity for members in the community to increase their skill levels and uh, potentially uh, get jobs 
as well. I think we've done, we've gone beyond. Okay, what well, Mr. Woods, what I'm asking, just for clarity, mm -hmm. okay, you've gotten to the point where you say that not only Thrive, but others, companies have um, done all that they can. I want to see the proof but, of the performance. I want, I want to be clear. I, I'm not saying they've done all they can because a lot of times, like I said, okay, these these contractors they come with their own GCs and they come with their own you know guys or whatever, and they want to use their own people. But if we set up some sort of penalty or whatever, and the penalty is too low, they'd be willing to pay the penalty to continue to just. Okay. Um, use their own people. So can we do this? Like I asked, uh, if we can get the proof of the past performance, what has transpired to show the effort to retain minority business. Show us, show us what has been done. Who have you, um, who did you put the bids out to? Give us those names because the community is only seeing, it's not showing up. So Let's put it on the table. Let's prove that these developers that are coming into our community, getting, um, receiving CRA monies, mm -hmm. that they are following the requirement. And if they're not, accountability. We want to see um, transparency, mm -hmm. and we want to see the proof. That's what the district wants. So that's what we're asking for. More okay. than happy to provide what information we have. Okay. Yeah, and and I, I know that it won't be a problem. You'll be able to provide it because it's already somewhere documented because we understand how you work. So it's just a matter of providing the information and that way we can move forward. But at this time, we're, I agree with um, the homeowners associations that are asking that no other funds be distributed at this time until we could get an understanding of where the funds and how they're being, how the uh, minority businesses are being included. Hmm. And Mayor and Clarence, yes, I, I want to see all of that information, but I want us to be very careful um, we, when we use words like the district, because actually this is a District 2 project, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, so that's a district. District 2 is a district. Um, and I want us to make sure that we're not just focusing all of a sudden on Thrive and the developers of Thrive. Exactly. I want us to make sure that this is much more encompassing. Um, and I would like to see it go back to probably when this commission began, uh, well, the prior commission, so the last four and a half years or whatever. I want to see all of those projects because, again, I don't want this focus to be on Thrive and this particular developers because that's totally misplaced. And I'm not in favor of holding up the funds for this project. This project is a transformative project for District 2 and also the entire city. Um, the amount of money that the developers have put into this project far exceed most CRA projects that come before this city commission. The percentage, correct me if I'm wrong, Clarence. Uh, well, yes, they, they've uh, put in, the, the total project cost is uh, going to be about $9.5 million. Uh, what they're getting from the CRA with this million dollars will be uh, three and a half, plus they have about almost about 495000 in streetscape money. So uh, it's a little less than half. Right. My, pro my point is that we have seen many projects come before us uh, on the CRA where we have contributed as a city up to 90% of the overall cost of a project. And so that's why I want to see all the projects. We haven't... We haven't deferred, we haven't delayed, we haven't stopped any of those projects and said, don't spend any more money until we have a report. So I certainly don't want to start that now uh, because this project needs to move forward. So I would ask, I would ask my colleagues to let this project uh, move forward with this, with this resolution. Uh, I think it's really important. At the same time, I think Commissioner Beasley-Pittman is right in requesting that kind of information going forward but I'm certainly not willing at this point in time to hold this particular project hostage until we get that information. Thank you. And, and, and let me just um, provide a, a little more clarity as well. Uh, really, when we're talking about um, these community benefits, uh, the smaller projects where we're talking about, where we're giving 300 and uh, less than a million dollars, you know, there's, we still, they still can hire folks from the neighborhood, but you're not talking about really big jobs that are significant. So um, if you want me to bring back uh, some information, I would ask that it be uh, projects that are over 
a million dollars uh, and whatnot. Because the smaller ones, um, they don't provide that many jobs at all. Okay, any other questions of Mr. Wood or Mr. Fish? Someone? I'd like to introduce the resolution. It's, uh, it's been, okay, the resolution's been introduced. Any other further questions? I guess please call the roll. A resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the Fort Lauderdale Community Re Redevelopment Agency amending resolution number 19-08, resolution number 22-01, and resolution number 22-07 to increase funding under the Development Incentive Program from $2.5 million to $3.5 million to Thrive Development Group, LLC, authorizing the Executive Director to execute any and all related instruments and delegating authority to the Executive Director to take certain actions and providing for an effective date. Commissioner Glassman? Yes. Commissioner Beasley-Pittman? No. Vice Chair Sturman? Yes. Commissioner Herbst? Yes. Chair Trentalis? Yes, and the resolution is approved. Um, Commissioner Beasley-Pittman, you wanted to raise a, a, a matter for discussion. Has that already been discussed now? Is, or is there something else you wanted to talk about? Remember you said earlier? That like, was part of it. Now I thought it was. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm like, yes, we covered the dis discussion. The subject matter. Yes. Okay, yes. all right, very good. Well, it behooves us to move forward on that, not that, not let that issue drop. And, uh, and I think that uh, your comments are well taken, and uh, we need to have uh, more definition and transparency on this subject than we have had in the past. Okay, is there any further business of the CRA? There being none. Okay, so Mr. City Manager, instead of asking everybody in this room to leave, uh, why don't we all do this, the collective bargaining meeting up at the conference, uh, conference room on uh, the eighth floor, okay. and, uh, and then we can uh, begin our meeting. Let's see, hey, what time is it now? Mr. Uh, Mayor, if you'd six like. Six o'clock. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, also um, so that we're not rushed to, um, if you'd like, uh, you could also consider doing the regular meeting and then doing the. The you want to close. do that? Yeah, if, that, if that's your choice. Is that, are you okay with that? Okay, well, we are going to take a little bit of a break. Uh, so let's come back here at 6.20, and uh, we'll begin our evening meetings. Excuse me, everybody, we ran late today, sorry. Oh.